All right. Good morning. It is Wednesday, April 28th, uh, and uh, we are rapidly <laughs> we are rapidly for my for the grading. Is that what I need the antidepressants for? We are rapidly reaching the end of this uh, class. So we are on to our last section and our last organ system, and that is the reproductive system. So we will be doing that for the next two weeks. Uh, we have, as you can see here, uh, three assignments left. Uh, your lobster uh, on oh, endocrinology. Gosh. Yep. Uh, your uh, unit 27 review uh, is due Monday the 10th. Uh, you've got a lobster on the- Why? I wasn't- All right, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, Make sure you're all muted unless you want to talk. Um, so we have all of that uh, going on. Uh, notice uh, there's nothing due on Monday the 3rd uh, when we come back next week, but there's probably going to be one more daily quiz left. So who knows what day that might possibly be on. And then we're done and on into our uh, exams. Uh, you, on Wednesday the 12th, you have your last lab and lecture exam, same as it ever was, you know what to expect from that. And then we enter finals week. So Monday the 17th, we do not have class that is part of a finals week. So there's no class that day. So uh, you do back a week after the lab and lecture exam for our cumulative final exam. Remember that cumulative final exam is gonna be 100 multiple choice questions. It does count as a grade on its own, but remember also it has the potential to replace your lowest lecture score. All your lab exams count, but your lowest lecture score can be replaced because I know some of you either struggled on the first one or something else happened along the way, life gets in the way, you have a, a challenge with an exam and the lecture exam is not what you want it to be you do have that opportunity to show me that you've gained the information, retained the information, and by being successful on the final, I will reward, reward you for that uh, by replacing your lowest lecture score with that final. And then after that, you finally get to sleep. All right, questions on any of that? Okay, if we're all satisfied with what the game plan is for the uh, next couple weeks, let's go ahead and get started with lecture. As I mentioned, we are on to our reproductive system, which is a somewhat unique system uh, for us. So let's talk about some of the ways that that is kind of different from what we've been dealing with uh, in the past. Uh, for starters, whoa, uh, for starters, it is not a continuous functioning system, right? Uh, your cardiovascular system, right? From even before you were born was active and pumping and doing its thing, right? Your uh, respiratory system and so on and so forth has been since birth and you took that first breath and cried has been functional. It doesn't take Sundays off and things along those lines, but our reproductive system is not a system that is continuously functioning, right? It typically is uh, suppressed until puberty and then it becomes functional after that. Of course, like all organ systems, we have primary and accessory organs. What are the primary organs in the reproductive system? Would that be the ones responsible for the, I guess, um, production of gametes? And what would those organs be? So in males, testicles, and in uh, females, ovaries? Exactly. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So the collectively, they're known as the gonads. Absolutely. There is a generic term for that. But you're absolutely right. The testes in males and the ovaries in females are the primary organs. I noticed there was a big pause there because, again, uh, everybody's re reluctant to say things like penis and vagina. And I will remind you, this is an anatomy and physiology class. You are allowed to say penis and vagina. It's just penis and vagina is not the right answer for this question here. The gonads are indeed the primary organs. And as mentioned, the reason for that is they produce those gametes. Right, uh, as when my daughter was very young and she was asking us about these questions, the way we explained it to her is that mommy and daddy uh, have these puzzle pieces they put together to make her and those puzzle pieces are indeed the gametes. Uh, the spermatozoa for the males and the ova for the females or what we commonly refer to as the egg and the sperm. So absolutely that is the one of the primary functions of the reproductive system is the production of those gametes, uh, those sex cells. 
there you go, spermatozoan males, ovin females. And as we also talked about in the past, females get the honor and the privilege of taking those puzzle pieces and housing them and nurturing them and developing them inside of themselves uh, for 40 weeks until they then get to push a basketball out of their vaginal canal. But as we've also talked about, those, uh, those gonads, the ovaries and the testes, also play an important role in the production of our sex hormones. Three main classes, remember in males, those are the androgens, and in females, they are the estrogens and the progestins. And as we talked about when we were discussing the endocrine system, uh, those sex hormones play a role in the growth and development of many of the organs and tissues of the body, helping our development, helping our growth, helping our maturity from immature boy and girl to mature man and woman. Obviously, they help in the development and the function of the reproductive organs themselves, making sure that they function. And again, uh, those sex drives, that sex behavior, uh, those sexual characteristics that again, we associate with being mature and sexually viable individuals. Now, uh, as we also talked about, um, this is the first real organ system where we're seeing significant differences between the males and the females. They both have the same basic functions uh, but one has a lot more bells and whistles, right? And it's like a car. All cars basically function the same way. However, you know, and I'll have an engine. However, if you didn't know how an engine worked and you wanted to figure it out, would you want to look at the engine of a 1968 Volkswagen Bug? Or would you want to look at the engine of a 2021 Lexus? Which one would be the good starting point for figuring out how these things worked? The bug. Yeah, the Volkswagen, absolutely the bug. And that's kind of how it is with the reproductive system. The males are definitely the bugs and the females are definitely the Lexuses. The male both basically have same general functions, but the female has way more bells and whistles. So we are going to start with the much more basic version of the reproductive system. The male, get that one done and out of the way, and then we can focus much more time on the more complicated and complex female reproductive system. So here's the bug, the male reproductive system. Again, we have those testes uh, that we talked about with a major organ. And then we have a duct system. And most importantly, this is a closed duct system. What do I mean by that when I say it's a closed duct system? It's only for that organ system. It doesn't open anywhere else. Yeah, absolutely. Basically, as the sperm are produced in the uh, testis, there's really only one route it can take. Uh, and those tubes basically carry that sperm all the way until it ultimately leaves out of the, uh, the male's body. And it can't really go anywhere else. So absolutely, there's no choices, there's no options for it here. Uh, obviously, that seems like a weird thing to say, but I think the implication of this, as I'm sure you understand, is that the female's duct system is actually going to be open. And we're going to have to talk about the implications for that. But again, we're starting first with the simple closed system. It includes such structures as the epididymis, the ductus deferens, or what is also known as the vas deferens, the ejaculatory duct, and the urethra. And then, of course, uh, we can't forget about the accessory organs. We are going to have primarily glands, uh, the paired seminal vesicles. So there are two of those the single prostate, and then the paired bulbourethral glands. Uh, again, uh, these glands play an important role in helping to produce the semen. The semen that we produce is not just sperm. Sperm are the gametes that are necessary for the fertilization of the egg, uh, but it also has a lot of accessory components to that semen that are produced by these glands. And then of course, we can't forget the external genitalia, which for the male uh, is the penis and the scrotum. All right, as we mentioned, the testis is our primary uh, organ of the male reproductive system. 
Um, here we see it from uh, we see it from kind of this longitudinal view, and here we see all of this from a sagittal view. And before we start talking about the testes, let's talk about where it is housed. Uh, it is housed in a structure known as the scrotum. Uh, this is basically a fold of skin and superficial fascia that extends beyond the body cavity. Now, there are many uh, biologists who believe that our sole function as organisms are to basically produce more organisms. Right, so reproduction is the most important and vital function that an organism can have. Now, if that's the case, why in the world would we take the testes that are responsible for that and put them in this fold of skin outside of the body cavity? Right, other than the control? fact, I'm sorry? Temperature control? Yeah, absolutely. It's all about temperature control. Absolutely. Right. That and I guess occasionally you can win $10,000 on America's Funniest Home Videos when you get hit in it. But absolutely, it is outside the abdominal pelvic cavity, basically beneath the root of the penis. And the reason for that is temperature regulation. Absolutely. And we'll talk about why that's so important in just a minute. That scrotum contains a paired uh, testicles uh, and they are here. Actually, let's do this. So we have the paired testicles that are basically um, contained within the scrotal sac. Now, one of the terms that we are gonna use a fair amount in this class, in this section is a term homologous. Homologous basically means uh, that it is something that uh, is derived from the same cells in men and women. So basically it means they are comparable structures. In females, uh, they have, and again, we'll talk about the external genitalia of the females when we get to it, but they have a fold of skin on the outer forming the vestibule, the space around the vagina known as the labia majora. Well, in males, those same cells that form those two layers of, of uh, labia in the female extend out and basically connect together to form the scrotum of the males. So basically the scrotal sac and the labia majora are homologous structures. And we see a little bit of that from an anatomical standpoint. Right. If you happen to have a scrotum sac or easy access to a scrotum sac, uh, then uh, I encourage you to take a look at this. If you don't have easy access, as long as you've been vaccinated, you're now allowed to go out to bars and find some random gentleman and ask to see this particular structure. What you can do is ask to identify and, and, and observe the raffi of the individual. And what you will see is on uh, the midline of the scrotum, there is actually a raised ridge. This raised ridge runs along the midline of the scrotum and it is known as the raffi. Oops, did I spell it right? And this raffi is actually where those folds of skin basically fuse together to form that scrotum. Yes, exactly. It's homework. It's for science. Uh, most boys, if you ask to observe their raffi, honestly won't mind. Uh, so uh, feel free to do so. Um, so yes, yeah, so you have that raised ridge on the midline where they come together and they form. And again, it's because it's that homologous structure. And as we talked about, uh, the function of the testis is to maintain appropriate temperature. Of the testis. Now, the reason this is important is we can produce sperm at a warmer temperature, but the sperm will not be viable. So to produce viable sperm, and of course, what do I mean by viable? Sperm that are in fact effective in uh, 
initiating fertil fertilization of a... Exactly, yeah. Go, exactly. Yeah. Being viable means that they're capable of doing their job. And Daniel's right. In this case, that job is to fertilize an egg. So to produce viable sperm, they have to be at a temperature that is about three degrees below core body temperature. So again, uh, this the testis, if they were inside of the abdominal pelvic cavity, uh, would not be able to pr they would produce sperm, but those sperm would not be capable of swimming. They would not be capable of fertilizing an egg. Now, they do indeed start in the abdominal pelvic cavity. In fact, as we'll talk about, the scrotum uh, and the fascia inside the scrotum is really an extension of the parietal peritoneum. Uh, they start in the abdominal pelvic cavity and typically uh, descend uh, prior to birth, usually around the seventh month of gestation. Really, I did not know that. How do you know that? <laughs> um, you work in a lab. Ah, there you go. That explains it. Uh, so yes, the, the, the testes dist typically descend around the seventh month. Occasionally, a male will be born uh, where one or both of his testes have not descended. And uh, in the past, uh, that they didn't think it was that big of a deal because after all, these aren't going to be functional until uh, puberty. And so often, uh, you, you know, after a month or two, uh, it would descend on its own. And in rare instances, when it didn't, they would go in and do it surgically. However, research has since shown that if the uh, testis maintains in the abdominal pelvic cavity for a prolonged period of time, it dramatically increases the likelihood of testicular cancer. So now on birth, if after a week or two, the testis hasn't descended, they will be more aggressive about going and doing it surgically just because of that increased re risk of testicular cancer, right? Before they didn't think it was that big of a deal because they're not gonna be using it for 13, 15, 16 years anyway. Uh, but uh, now they've shown that there's a correlation between uh, 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 that maintenance, maintaining in the abdominal pelvic cavity and increase in testicular cancer. So now they're much more aggressive about descending it uh, surgically if it doesn't do it on its own. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit here, get rid of all of that, about the anatomy of this. So uh, as I mentioned, we have this extension of the parietal peritoneum known as the tunica vaginalis that extends out uh, along that. And notice also this extension of the peritoneum, like the peritoneum in the abdominal pelvic cavity has two layers. There is a visceral layer that is around the testis itself. And then there is also the parietal layer that lines the inner surface of the uh, scrotal sac as well. So we have that extension, that tunica vaginalis. That tunica vaginalis wraps around or is contained within, let's say it that way, a structure known as the spermatocord. Uh, again, this is a structure that is outside the abdominal pelvic cavity, but it is incredibly metabolically active. So we need to have blood vessels coming into and out of the testis so that they can produce the gajillions of sperm they make during the course of a day. Uh, there are nerves to control activity and obviously to provide protection and pain, as well as the ductus deferens, which is going to carry the sperm into the abdominal pelvic cavity. So rather than having all these things willy nilly, uh, they are bundled up into a fibrous structure known as the spermatocord. And as we talked about back in 430, if you remember when we were in the muscular system, it passes through our inguinal canal. This is an opening in our inguinal ligament. If you remember, the inguinal ligament was an important structure that attaches to the pubic tubercle and to the superior anterior iliac crest. It was an attachment point for the abdominal muscles, the iliopsoas passes underneath it, all of those things. And both males and females have it. However, in males, there is a physical opening, an actual space through it, known as the inguinal canal. Females actually have an opening there, 
but in females, it is a potential space. What do I mean again when I say a potential space? It could be a space, but isn't. Right, exactly. Uh, the perfect example of this is to take my hands. I obviously have two hands. If I mash my two hands together, I don't suddenly have one hand, right? I have two hands, but is there anything between my two hands? No, of course not. So in between my two hands is a potential space. There's a space that could be there, but right now there's not. And that's pretty much how it is in females. It's just a potential space in females, but in males, it is an opening that the spermatic cord passes through. If you remember, the reason we talked about this in the muscular system is because if you have an increase in pressure, inside of the abdominal pelvic cavity, that pressure, if it becomes too great, can look for a place to escape. Uh, all of us have belly buttons, so it is equally likely in males and females to escape through that belly button. But in males, another place that it can escape is here through that inguinal ligament. And so you can get a bulging of the tissue out of that space containing some uh, serious fluid in extreme cases like an omentum or some of the mesentery or even an organ could express a portion of like a small intestine or something could express out of that a space. And what do we call that condition? Hernia. A hernia, absolutely. So while males and females are equally likely to get umbilical hernias, Males, because the opening is actually there, are much, much more likely to get an inguinal hernia than a female is. It can rarely happen in females, but it is much more common to happen in males. And that is that opening in that inguinal canal uh, for the passageway for that spermatic cord and all of the structures that it is supporting inside. As I mentioned, our goal is to maintain a consistent intrascrotal temperature, keeping the temperature three degrees lower than body temperature so that we can produce viable, um, actually, let's do it this way. Uh, so we can uh, produce viable sperm. And there are three important structures. That help us to maintain consistent temperature, right? Yes, being outside of the body means that it has the potential to be colder, but the temperature out here in the world fluctuates much more uh, rapidly and much uh, more variably than what's happening inside of the body. And as a result of that, we need to be able to modify the relative position of the testis in relation to the body to make it warmer or to make it cooler. And there are two sets of muscles that can help us to do that. The first set of muscles is a muscle that basically lines the inner wall of the scrotal sac. This muscle is what is known as the dartus muscle. And this dartus muscle is smooth muscle. Now, notice looking at this, it is essentially kind of like our diaphragm, a bell-shaped muscle. And as we know, when a bell-shaped muscle contracts, what happens to a bell-shaped muscle when it contracts? It flattens. Yeah, it flattens out. So when it contracts and shortens, it flattens. And so as it flattens, basically, this is able to change the shape of the scrotum so that it can be smaller or larger. Obviously, if it is larger, there is more space for the testes to get further away from the body. And we get that shrinkage when it gets cold where it kind of draws back up closer to the body, trying to keep them warmer by keeping them closer to the surface of the body. Now, is this something a male can voluntarily control? Can he voluntarily control the size of his scrotum? No. Change it on command? No, it's smooth muscle. So obviously there is involuntary control of this. But there is a second set of muscles. This second set of muscles is what is known as the cremaster muscles. And the cremaster muscles actually wrap around the individual 
testes. Uh, these are long cylinder shape and these are skeletal muscle, right? Obviously, so it's, let's say it this way, elongated skeletal muscle. So when it contracts, it shortens. And when it shortens, basically it can draw the testes closer or farther away from the body. So basically it can move them within the scrotal sac. Now, does that mean that every male in the morning wakes up and licks his finger, feels the temperature, and then voluntarily sets the length of his testes in relation to his body? No. No, of course not. Not any more than all of you for the past 30 minutes that I've been talking have every five seconds had to think, all right, now would be a good time to blink. And now I'll blink again. And now my eyes are a little dry, so I'll blink again. Obviously, it is reflexes that control this, but it is skeletal muscle. So is it possible for a male to voluntarily control the movement of the testes? Absolutely. When you're in the bathroom at that bar, seeing that raffi of the individual, ask him to flex his cremaster muscles for you. And he will be able to elevate and descend his testis and feel free to ooh and ah at him when he does that. All right. All of this is great. All of this is fine. All of this is dandy. But we have one other really major issue. As we've talked about, we have these testes outside of the abdominal pelvic cavity uh, because um, of temperature. It is, we need to be three degrees lower than our core body temperature. But what do we know about our blood? What do we know about the temperature of our blood? It's hot. It's hot. It's actually two or three degrees warmer than core body temperature. Our blood is really hot. It's even warmer than cold body temperature. As we mentioned, our testes are incredibly metabolically active. Males are producing millions upon millions of sperm during the course of the day. We're so metabolically active. I, I'm shocked we're asked to do anything else. We should just be able to just sit and produce gametes because it requires so much metabolism and so much energy to be able to do that. But it doesn't do us any good if the blood bringing the oxygen and the nutrients is screaming hot. So luckily, we have our friend that we just talked about in the last section. We have a counter current mechanism. <laughs> it's okay, you can play it for him on recording. Uh, the counter current mechanism and this counter current mechanism as we've talked about uh, can act in this case as that first one we talked about a heat sink. Basically, we have that arterial blood, that testicular artery, that is carrying blood. Uh, so let's do that. From the body. Uh, actually, let's do it this way. I'll sneak and put this down here. Carrying the blood to the testis. So leaving here from the body. And as we know, it is very hot when that is occurring and it is going to the testis. But luckily we have our testicular vein. The testicular vein forms this big elaborate mesh-like structure with many, many branches to it, right? Almost kind of a mesh or net-like structure that we've used before known as a plexus. 
right? So here we have our testicular uh, vein that forms what we call the pimpiniform plexus. And this pimpiniform plexus basically acts as a heat sink. The blood in it coming into that vein heading back towards the body is cool blood. That cool blood then draws the heat out of the artery. As it draws it out of the artery, it warms the blood that is going back to the heart. And the advantage of that is that it cools the blood that goes to the testis. And that way it helps to maintain temperature. It doesn't do any good to move the testis around in space if we have this smoke and hot blood coming to it. So this countercurrent mechanism, this heat sink formed by this draping pampiniform plexus of the testicular vein all over the top of the testicular artery helps to absorb the heat and help to maintain that appropriate temperature. And I've done a truly amazing job of drawing these. It's like real life looking at this picture. But if we actually look at the illustrations from your textbook, we can see these things as well. So again, we have that dartus muscle within the wall of the scrotum, the cremaster that can change the position of the testis, and that pimpiniform plexus of the testicular vein. And here's the pretty picture. Notice as we look at the pretty picture, again, we can see lining the wall of the scrotum, we can see that dartus muscle, right? That elongated cremaster muscle that helps to attach it and anchor it to the, uh, to the pelvis for ascension and descension. And then this big, huge, elaborate plexus, almost looks like a, a venous anastomosis, where we've got this big, elaborate branching vein draped over the top of the artery to help to produce that heat sink with that countercurrent mechanism to reduce the temperature of the blood. So these three vital structures help us to maintain appropriate temperature of the testis so that we can produce viable sperm. Again, we can produce sperm without it, but they won't be capable of fertilizing an egg. All right. Questions? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So um, this is a little previously mentioned about like the importance of the testes um, descending. So when um, uh, the fetus is developing, where do the testes um, develop? Where they do they develop, need to descend from? They develop in the abdominal pelvic cavity. So again, obviously the ovaries and testes are homologous structures. And so both of them start in the abdominal pelvic cavity. They both form the abdominal pelvic cavity. However, in males, they are then going to differentiate and then descend down into the scrotal sac. But they do start in the abdominal pelvic cavity, yes. All right, cool. Yeah. Thanks. No, great question. Any others? All right, excellent. So that is our scrotal sac. Let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of the testis now. Here we get a closer up view of the testis and we can see a couple key characteristics to it. And notice, as I mentioned before, here we see that parietal tunica vaginalis helping to form the cavity around it. And then the visceral tunica vaginalis, which is the outermost layer of the testis. So we have that tunica vaginalis. However, if you notice the majority of the testis, the bulk of the testis is this fibrous white material and hence the name white, tunica albigenia. So basically what we have is we have that tunica vaginalis on the outer surface of the testis. And then inside of that, 
we have this thick fibrous, and again, obviously these touch, but my drawing skills are horrible. Um, the tunica albigenia on the inside of that. Now notice something else about the tunica albigenia. Not only does it form the outer fibrous shell of the testis, but there are extensions of that tunica albigenia that extend in and penetrate deep into the testis. These structures are what are known as the septa, septa being plural, singular being septum. And it basically divides the testis into individual lobules. So each of these little compartments is an individual lobule. In each testis, there is somewhere between, oh, about, what is it, 250 and 300 of these individual compartments, these individual lobules uh, that it is compartmentalized into. Within each one of them, they have uh, these sperm producing structures known as the seminiferous tubules. The, each seminiferous tubule is about uh, three feet long, something like that in length. So again, if you think about it, we have one to four of these three feet length structures inside of each of these 250 to 300 lobules. So when we talk about the ability to make sperm, if you were to take all of those seminiferous tubules and spread them out end to end, it would hurt a lot. All right, excellent. Now, seminiferous tubules are where we make the sperm. And once we make them, do they start swimming their way through all the tubules of the male's reproductive tract? Now, as we'll learn, swimming requires a tremendous amount of energy and resources. We don't want to be wasting ATP, uh, just having them spinning their wheels literally as they're waiting to be ejected from the male's reproductive tract. So the movement of the sperm out of the seminiferous tubules is done by two things. The first thing is by fluid pressures. The cells in the seminiferous tubules make fluid, and as they produce more fluid, that produces a pressure gradient in that fluid. And pressure, as we know in fluid, goes from a high pressure to a low pressure, so it'll slowly move out that way. But pressure gradients aren't going to be enough on its own. So lining the outer surface of these seminiferous tubules are a thin layer of smooth muscle cells known as myoid cells. And these myoid cells don't quite produce peristaltic waves, but they do produce contractions of the tubules to help in the propulsion of the sperm out of the seminiferous tubules. Here we see a histology view, and we'll have a couple more we will look at as well where we can see uh, this seminiferous tubule in cross section. Like I said, each tube is about three feet long. So again, uh, it's about a half mile per testis of sperm producing organs, right? And that's what they do. They develop the spermatozoa. It starts and we'll actually see this from stem cells that are gonna be located here by the outer wall of our seminiferous tubule. And then as they uh, divide and mature, they move towards the lumen. And once we reach the lumen, as you can kind of see best in this one here, uh, they are gonna become our sperm shaped cells. They're not gonna be mature uh, sperm yet, but we're gonna go from cell-shaped cells to sperm-shaped cells, all here in our seminiferous tubule. Of course, remember we also talked about, and we did this in the endocrine, so let's change colors, orange. There are these cells located outside of the seminiferous tubules. These are those interstitial cells of Leydig. And again, these interstitial cells of Leydig are, of course, where we produce our androgens. And notice here, uh, pick red, we have a couple blood vessels. 
that we can see in this space as well. So again, we've seen this anatomy before when we were in the endocrine system, so it shouldn't be entirely new. However, we will look closer at this structure and be able to identify specific cells inside of it as well. Here's a nice simple illustration that shows this. Again, notice we are going from cell-shaped cells to sperm-shaped cells as we go from the base of this structure towards the lumen. Notice also this one does a nice job of showing us those, uh, let's not use purple for this, let's use green, those myoid cells on the outer surface that again are gonna be able to produce those smooth muscle contractions that are gonna be able to uh, help to produce pressures in the fluid to propel the sperm where we want them to go. Notice outside our seminiferous tubules, we have those interstitial cells of Leydig where we're producing our hormones. However, the other cell that I know we talked about, but I know we didn't talk in depth about it, and you see it here in purple, uh, but I'll see if the green, no, I already used green, uh, see if the dark red shows up on side of it. All of this purple stuff that it, the shaded purple stuff that you're seeing here represents this special cell that have these very a pyramid or diamond shaped nuclei, which if you remember were the nurse cells or the sustentacular cells or the Sertoli cells that we talked about that play a vital role in the regulation of sperm production and also produce some of the hormones that we're gonna talk about as well. They produce the fluid, they have all sorts of important functions. Oops. So again, we have our interstitial cells out here, the myoid cells on the outer surface. And since we're gonna talk about them in one second here, notice here, there's that diamond shaped nucleus. Here's another one of those kind of elongated nuclei. These are those nurse cells that we're gonna talk about as well. And here it is, an electron microscopy view. Again, you can see we are going from cell-shaped cells to sperm-shaped cells as we move towards the center of our lumen. Now, the reason males are able to produce a gajillion new sperm every day is because they have a unipotent stem cell. Remind me again what unipotent means? It can only differentiate into one type of cell. Exactly. It can only differentiate into one type of cell, this unipotent stem cell known as a spermatogonium. These spermatogonium are always going to be located on the border of the, with the basal surface. So here's one, here's one, here's one. They're all here at the basal surface of our seminiferous tubule. Stem cells, as we know, have no other job but to divide to produce new cells, and that's what they do, and they do it in mass. A male produces somewhere on the order of half a billion new sperm during the course of a day. As I said, we really so metabolically active doing that, we shouldn't have to do anything else. We should just be able to sit home while the women go out and you know make the money and bring home the food and do all those things and take care of us just so we can sit and make sperm and play video games, let's not forget about that. Uh, excellent. Uh, as I mentioned, here we see again, those nurse cells or Sertoli cells or sustentacular cells, any of those are acceptable names for them. And these cells produce a lot of very vital functions. As we saw on the illustration, as we saw when we look at it, they have these big, large elongated or diamond shaped nuclei but they have these massive cytoplasms. And notice also this illustration does a really great job of showing them. They actually form tight junctions with the cells next to them. What this allows these cells to do is basically form a barrier for these developing cells inside of the testis. Because after all, as we know, sex cells are very different from somatic cells. And right here 
in our blood vessels, we know we see a couple red blood cells, but we know there's also going to be some white blood cells in there as well. And we know those white blood cells jobs are to find things that aren't like us. Well, sex cells are not like us. Does that mean we want our immune response attacking and destroying our gametes? No. So these uh, Sertoli cells help to form a very important blood testis barrier to help to separate and protect these developing gametes so that they do not trigger an immune response. Vitally, vitally important function, but that is not all that these cells do. Uh, these cells also play an important role in actually controlling the development of the sperm. Way back when, when we were talking about the endocrine system, we said that there was a hormone that regulated the production of sperm. What hormone was it that regulated the production of sperm? Follicle stimulating hormone. Follicle stimulating hormone, absolutely. That follicle stimulating hormone uh, doesn't actually target the spermatogonia. What it actually targets are the nurse cells. And then the nurse cells are the ones that release the chemical signals to stimulate these cells to divide and mature. So it's actually the nurse cells that actually control the rate of sperm development. So the follicle stimulating hormone actually stimulates the nurse cells and then the nurse cell responds to that by controlling the sperm development. Remember we said fluid pressures are gonna play an important role in the movement of the sperm out of the seminiferous tubules. It is the nurse cells that are producing those fluids. And not only do those fluids move this, the spermatozoa, but they are going to maintain them as they move through the reproductive tract of the male. So it helps to move the sperm and helps to maintain the sperm. It is actually gonna produce some hormones, our inhibin, is produced by our uh, Sertoli cells. Inhibin, remember, um, as we talked about in the endocrine system, plays an important role in regulating the rate of gamete production, right? More is not always better. And half a billion seems like a lot, but half a billion plus 10 may be too fast. So it helps us to control the rate so that while we produce it, we produce it at an effect level. But our Sertoli cells also produces all sorts of important hormones, uh, pardon me, all sorts of important proteins. One of the most important proteins it produces is an androgen binding protein. What do you think androgen binding proteins do? It's not your question. Binds androgens. There you go, binds androgens, absolutely. If you remember when we talked about androgens like testosterone, we said that they were important for the maturation of the gametes. Androgens play no role in the production of sperm. A male can still produce half a billion sperm during the course of the day, even if he has zero androgens in his body. But those sperm won't be viable. The androgens are necessary to mature those sperm. And it turns out sperm maturation doesn't actually occur in the testis. It actually occurs in a tubular structure associated next to the testis, but actually outside of the tetanus, test, outside of the tetis, not tetanus, outside of the testis, uh, known as the epididymis. So obviously we need to get a way to get those androgens to the epididymis. And that's what our androgen binding protein does. These interstitial cells produce the androgens. Some of those androgens enter into the blood and circulate in our body, but others of them are brought into the lumen where they are then bound to our protein. And once we bind them to that protein, so I just slap it right in there, they can then be carried to the epididymis where those androgens can be used to mature the sperm. 
And if that's not enough for these nurse cells to do, notice also, as I mentioned, we have this transition from cell-shaped cells to sperm-shaped cells. Sperm are basically chromosome missiles that have one job and one job only. Get 23 chromosomes to an egg. So they don't need things like a rough endoplasmic reticulum or Golgi apparatus or most of their cytoplasm. So notice as this cell is transforming from a cell-shaped cell to a sperm-shaped cell, it is basically releasing massive amounts of cytoplasm and other components from inside of it. And that stuff isn't waste material. So that stuff is actually absorbed, phagocytosed by the nurse cells, which then can be given to the new developing cells so that they can keep recycling all of this stuff. So they play an important role in phagocytizing all of that excess material that is shed and recycling it so that we can keep those billions of cells going. Hugely, hugely important cells for the functions of the seminiferous tubule. All right, questions on that? So they, so they endocytose the organelle ejection of the developing gametes? Yes, as the developing gametes uh, shed some of their cytoplasm, the uh, nurse cells phagocytize that, uh, absorb those nutrients, and then they give those nutrients, those you know, building blocks to the stem cells, to the newly developing cells that are dividing and rapidly and producing new cells. So basically they recycle those resources. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. We've reached that time in a young anatomy and physiology instructor's life where we get to talk about the birds and the bees. Or as I mentioned with my daughter, where we talk about the making of and putting together of puzzle pieces. So we have puzzle piece making to talk about first. Uh, and of course, that occurs in a specialized process known as meiosis. You guys just had a, uh, a lobster do today talking about meiosis and the difference of meiosis and mitosis. So hopefully this should go pretty smoothly because the information should be relatively fresh in your mind. Uh, so we are going to talk about that. And specifically, we are going to talk about a process called uh, spermatogenesis. Spermatogenesis is, of course, the formation of the sperm. So we need to talk about this process. It is a three-step process involving first mitosis, then meiosis, and then spermiogenesis. So to understand this process of making sperm in males or spermatogenesis, we need to talk about mitosis, and then meiosis, and then spermiogenesis. Now, again, some of this information should be relatively fresh, uh, but I want to make sure we are comfortable with our definitions. As we've talked about in the past, really in the beginning of 430, as we talked about learning about science is like learning about another language, right? Biology has a language all of its own. But if you remember, we said in particular anatomy and physiology, and in particular genetics, there is a tremendous amount of vocabulary. So we want to make sure we have all our vocabulary comfortably understood, right? For starters, when we talk about all of our cells of our body, we say we have a diploid chromosomal number, right? What is the number of chromosomes you have in all of your somatic cells? 46. 46. Excellent. Is there a different way we could describe that, though? 23 pairs. 23 pairs. Absolutely. Right. You have these paired chromosomes. So again, in simplicity terms, we have a chromosome one for that we got from mom and a chromosome one we got from dad. 
we have a chromosome two we got from mom and a chromosome two we got from dad. And the key to these, C1, C1, C2, C2, is that these paired chromosomes, and let's write this out this way. have the same type of information. So for instance, on chromosome one, right here on both of them could be your blood type. Right here on both of them could be handedness. Right here on both of them, could be your predisposition to heart disease. Whereas over here on chromosome two, all right, this could be whether you can roll your tongue or can't roll your tongue and so on and so forth. So each set of chromosomes contain unique information, right? Each set. But the pairs have the same type. And so these pairs we call homologous chromosomes. So we have 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. Now, notice I keep saying that they have the same type of information, not necessarily identical information. Say, for instance, you got, it could be, you got a right-handed version of the gene from mom and a right-handed version of the gene from dad, you of course would be right-handed. Or conversely, if you got a left from mom and a left from dad, you would be left-handed. But is it possible to get a right from mom and a left from dad? Could you have gotten a right-handed gene from mom and a left-handed gene from dad? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So notice they're the same type of information, but not necessarily the same information. In fact, this is what both of my children look like, right? I am left-handed. I have two L chromosomes, right? Part of the proud 11%, uh, but uh, that pesky wife of mine may or may not be homologous. Uh, you know, we don't know if she's heterozygous or, or, uh, or homozygous. We don't know. But we know that for both of our kids, she gave them both R's because they got one R, one L. And so uh, despite my best intentions, they're both right-handed. But I love them almost as much as I would have if they were left-handed. So it's okay. All right. So we have the same type of information, but it may be different versions of the genes. Okay. So we have these homologous chromosomes that have unique information. And that's what diploid means too. So when we are talking about, I need to get rid of all of this stuff. When we talk about a, let's sneak this stuff up here. Those homologous chromosomes, I think we'll talk about in a second. Put that up there for now. So when we talk about a diploid number of chromosomes, basically we identify that uh, by the notation 2n. 2, of course, because it's paired. And the n refers to the number of unique chromosomes. We use this notation because while all humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, there are some plants that may have 50. Banana slugs have 14 unique ones, right? Things like that. So whatever the unique number of chromosomes are, if you're sexually um, uh, reproductive, then you get two copies of that. One from mom, one from dad, and we refer to that as 2N, right? However, if me and my wife want to make babies, do I want to take one of my two N cells and one of her two N cells and put them together to make a bit on offspring? 
No, my cell is going to have 46 chromosomes. Her cells are going to have 46 chromosomes. When we smash those together, suddenly we have a kid with 92 chromosomes and he's going to have wings or be able to climb on walls or have some other type of superpower, right? Or something along those lines, third head, whatever the problem is, it's going to be issues. So of course we need to, when we make those special sex cells, those gametes, we have to cut the number of chromosomes in half. When we have those sex cells, for the sex cells, we only want one copy of each unique chromosome. And so we refer to that as the haploid number. And of course, that would just be N. And those are the sex cells. Uh, do I have it here? No. Okay, excellent. Homologous chromosomes, as we mentioned, are the paired chromosomes that have the same type of information on them, or with homologous. And remember, way back in 430, and hopefully uh, you talked about this or looked at this a little bit in the labster, during, before a cell can divide, it must replicate the DNA so that you have two copies of them. If you remember, we had those X-shaped structures where we had, actually, let's just draw it this way for simplicity. There is one coiled up copy of the genetic material, but remember it is attached to a second copy of the genetic material. And these copies are called the sister chromatids. Those sister chromatids were held together by a special protein what was that protein that holds the sister chromatids together? Centromere. There you go, excellent. We have that centromere. And so it forms that, what kind of looks under the microscope like an X-shaped structure. It's actually closer to an H-shaped structure, but it's that X-shaped structure. And someone remind me when replication takes place? during a cell cycle? G2, it ends at G2. Oh, well, it's so, but when does the actual replication of the DNA? Prophase. G1. So when does replication, or one could even say synthesis of the DNA occur? S. There you go, during S phase of interface. S phase of interface is when that replication takes place. So back in interphase, before it even starts to divide, we make that copy. This one chromosome has two copies. So it's two sister chromatids held together by a centromere. But remember, we still consider this one chromosome. So what we need is a way to indicate that the chromosome has been replicated. So that cell, when it's in G0 phase or when it's in the G1 phase, we would just refer to it as 2N because it has its 46 chromosomes. But when it is replicated, we can actually change our notation slightly. And your book doesn't do this, but I do. And that's one of the reasons why I want to emphasize it here, because it'll help you to make more sense. It is going to be 2NR, where that R indicates that we have two copies. R indicates that it's replicated.
And that will help us, I think, to avoid some confusion when we are talking about this process of meiosis. So I wanna make sure we understand that R indicates that it's replicated, that we have those two sister chromatids being held together by that centromere. All right, so, and I think I can connect it by centromere, so there you go. So I just wrote that there, so we can get rid of that, get rid of that, and move this here. All right, so that is the vocabulary that should help us to understand what is going on. Uh, and then what we will do and we will come back is we will quickly review mitosis, uh, talk a little bit more about meiosis. But again, this is information uh, after our uh, labster you should hopefully be comfortable with. So it should go pretty smoothly. And then once we are certain we understand what's happening in mitosis and meiosis, uh, then we can then talk about how these specifically occur in the male in the process of spermatogenesis. All right, questions on that? All right, that sounds like a lot of heavy lifting to me. So I think that's a good, this is a good place to take our first break and most importantly, go get some caffeine so that I can talk really, really fast for you guys because I know how much you love that. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll take our first break. Uh, we will return uh, in 15 minutes, which looks like 920. And I will start the recording at that point. All right, any questions before we take our first break? All right, I will see you guys in 15 minutes. Let's go ahead and get started. Our goal now is to fully understand meiosis, but again, to do that, we need to understand a bit about mitosis. So hopefully some of this stuff is pretty fresh. Uh, and one of the easiest ways to start is to think in terms of the goal. What is the goal of mitosis? To produce genetically identical daughter cells. I like that, excellent. Basically to divide one cell into two, identical cells. And uh, by identical cells, we mean that we want those identical cells to be uh, both identical to each other and to the original, right? I think that that is a fair. And of course, this process involves one division. That division of course has four or five stages in it, depending on how you think of it. Let's go ahead and move this down all the way. Oops, not you. you. Uh, four or five stages, depending on how you see it. What are those four stages? Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Yeah, prophase. Uh, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And again, if you have trouble remembering that, just remember what you have in the bathroom. You have a PMAT. Uh, for prophase, prophase, a lot of stuff happens if you remember. So sometimes they will either talk about it as early and late prophase. Uh, we'll talk about things that happen in early and late, or sometimes they divide early prophase into being prophase and late prophase becomes that intermediate stage, prometaphase. So either of those two ways are fine ways of thinking about it. We go through those stages. The goal is to divide the uh, genetic material so that we have two identical cells. Now here I have two identical cells or uh, one, mother cell here. So let's go ahead and start that. And of course, if this was a human cell, this human cell I would need inside of its nucleus, I would need to be able to draw 46 chromosomes. Now that would be a lot to try to fit into there. So what I'm going to do instead is just go with six. Of course, with those six chromosomes, we are going to have uh, one that we get from mom. 
chromosome one from mom, chromosome one from dad, chromosome two from mom, chromosome two from dad, and chromosome three from mom, and chromosome three from dad. All right, so this cell, notice the way that I've drawn it now, we have our 2n number, uh, and that total in this case would be six. Three unique chromosomes, that's our n, three unique chromosomes, one copy from mom, one copy of dad, and six total chromosomes. So for the daughter cells that we make, we had that one division, one cell divides into two cells. Let's not do that. Inside their nuclei, we want the exact same thing. Inside of this nucleus, inside of this nucleus, we want all of that to be the same. So we want a chromosome one from mom, a chromosome two from mom, a chromosome three from mom, oops, a chromosome one from dad, a chromosome two from dad, and a chromosome three from dad. Excellent. All right. And so notice at the end of this process, we have two cells that are both 2n. They both have those six chromosomes, one copy from mom, one copy from dad. Of course, to get from one cell with six chromosomes to two cells with six chromosomes, as we've also talked about, we need to, during the S phase of interphase, replicate the genetic material. So we have two sister chromatids that can be divided And so now this cell, as it's getting ready to enter into mitosis, uh, this cell is now 2NR. The genetic material is replicated. So we still have six chromosomes. It still counts as six chromosomes because remember they are connected to each other. But now our goal is to line up those chromosomes, separate those chromosomes, pull the chromosomes to the different sides, and then bundle them back up into a nucleus. And that's basically what happens in prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. All right. Hopefully all of this is vaguely familiar and hopefully not so vaguely familiar after doing the uh, labster. Any questions or concerns about understanding mitosis before we move forward? We got to understand this to be able to make sense of the rest. So I just need to make sure we understand this. Excellent. Stunned silent stares is tells me I understand this perfectly and we can move on. Excellent. All right. So if we understand what's going on in mitosis, then let's talk about what's going on in meiosis and what our goal is here. What is our goal here in meiosis? To produce genetically different cells. Okay, how many? Four. Yeah, we want to divide one cell into four cells, and we want these four new cells to be two things. We want them to be um, have half the number of chromosomes. or again, the fancy word for that is haploid. And, whoops, that's not the return, that's the return.
we want them to be unique. Both unique from the original and unique from each other. Now, from the original is easy because the original one's going to have 46 chromosomes, or in our case, six, whereas the new cells we make, uh, uh, ours would have 23. And in this process, what are they going to have? How many cells, how many chromosomes would be in a haploid cell if this cell over here on the left is our starting point? 23. That's how many we have, but that's not the cell that I have over here on the left. This cell over here, if this cell divides and becomes haploid, how many chromosomes do I want in a haploid version of this? How many chromosomes does this cell have? Three. No, how many chromosomes does this cell have? Six. That cell has six. six. Six, so the haploid number would be how much? Three. There you go, see? Math is easy. Uh, All right, excellent. And of course, to do this, we cars two divisions. So we distinguish these two divisions by name. The first one we call meiosis one. And typically Roman numerals are used for these kind of like cranial nerves. But if you wanted to use the Arabic number one, I would be fine with that as well. The good news is we are gonna use the same basic uh, vocabulary in this process. So I'm gonna need probably to write a little bit smaller for this. Actually, let's do it this way first, 18. So we are going to have a prophase one. Oops, don't need that to be capitals anymore. A metaphase one. An anaphase one. and a telophase one. Now, with meiosis one, and I think I have enough room to sneak this into the top. One of the big differences between meiosis one and mitosis is meiosis one was worried about just dealing with each chromosome independently. Whereas in meiosis one, we need to deal with the homologous pairs. So we are gonna deal with the homologous chromosomes. That is basically one of the big, big differences between mitosis and meiosis. Now, if you think back to what we learned in 430, and hopefully you learned over the past two days of doing this, uh, prophase, in that prophase process, there are three main processes that occur in mitosis. The first thing that occurs in prophase one is we get a breakdown of the nuclear envelope, All right? The second thing that happens is our loose DNA and proteins condenses down into that chromosome. And what do we call the loose DNA and protein when it's just that big bowl of spaghetti inside of the nucleus? Chromatin. Chromatin, excellent. The loose chromatin, whoops, chromatin, uh, chromatin uh, folds into chromosomes. And let's also remember that those um, centrioles uh, migrate to the opposite poles of the cells. So we have those centrioles of the chromosome, of uh, the centrosome migrating to the opposite poles. Let's not use blue for that. Let's go ahead and use purple for that. So those are migrating to the opposite poles. 
Our nuclear envelope has completely broken down. Remember our centrals are gonna start producing spindle fibers that are gonna be coming out of them. Those star shaped spindle fibers that are gonna to help to move the chromosomes around. And uh, as we talked about our loose chromatin, and let's talk about our first example here with good old mom's chromosome one. Mom's chromosome one is gonna condense down into from that loose chromatin to that tightly packed chromosome, right? Those are all the things that happen in mitosis one. And there's not much difference here in meiosis one, except for one big important fourth step that is going to occur here in prophase one. Whereas in mitosis, it's every chromosome for itself. Here in prophase one, our homologous chromosomes, because remember that's what we care about, come together, they find each other, and they bind together with a special protein called synapsin. And when they bind together, they form a structure called a tetrad. So mom's chromosome one and dad's chromosome one are gonna find each other. And with that synapsin protein, zip themselves together. Mom's chromosome two and dad's chromosome two are gonna find each other, zip themselves together with that synapsin, forming a tetrad. And dad's chromosome three and mom's chromosome three are gonna find each other, line up together, use that synapsin protein, to zip themselves together and form a tetrad. So notice here, our homologous chromosomes come together to form tetrads. So in prophase one, we are forming a tetrad. Now, of course, as we know, these chromosomes have those kinetochores on their surface. So uh, our spindle fibers are going to attach to them so that can be moved around inside of the cell. All right, questions on that? Excellent. That brings us to metaphase. Just like metaphase in mitosis, this is where we move the chromosomes and line them up on the metaphase plate. However, in this case, remember we form tetrads. So our goal here is gonna to be to move the tetrads. We are going to break down and build up our spindles and we are gonna move the tetrads to the metaphase plate. So moms is here. and dad's is here. So notice for our first chromosome, it just so happened that uh, dad's chromosome lined up on the top and mom's chromosome lined up on the bottom. And what determined that?
Which one had recessive? True, that could be one way that we could do it. What else determines which one is on top, mom or dad? They take turns, mom on Monday, dad on Tuesday. Yep. Is it random? Exactly. Chance. Completely random. And guess what determines which of chromosome two lines up on top? The same. Yeah, it's completely random. Absolutely. How these line up is completely random as to which is on top and which is on the bottom. It is completely random, right? This is important because how they line up is going to determine where they go. Remember, one of our goals are to make unique chromosomes, I mean, unique gametes, right? So for this cell here with three tetrads, how many possible combinations could there be? How many ways could this line up differently? Well, let's think about this, right? How many options are there? Two, two chromosomes, mom and dad, right? How many independent chromosomes do we have? Three. And does the lining up of one affect the lining up of the other one? No. So basically this is two to the third power. And what's two to the third power? There you go. Excellent. So eight different ways. And that gives us some independent variation. But someone remind me again how many chromosomes we have. We have 46. 46. So how many unique ones? 23. So that would be two to the 23rd power, right? Anyone figure out on those fingers and toes what two to the 23rd power is? Probably not on your fingers and toes, but I'm pretty certain you could plug it into one of your smart devices, like that phone you have sitting right next to you. And what is two to the 23rd power? Allison's either on Tinder or she's trying to figure this out for us. I can't find the right buttons. <laughs> All right, someone help her out. I will wait. It's 8 million. Oh my goodness, it's just 8 million. Do you want the exact number? Nope. Took me a second, but. Do you yeah. have the exact number? Yeah, there you go. 8,388,608. Over 8 million different possible ways that these can line up, <clears throat> which is exactly why you look similar to your siblings, but not identical to your siblings. Because just the way we flip these 23 coins to decide which pair of chromosomes are on top, you can get over 8 million different combinations. So like I said, unless you're identical twins, right? You look similar to your siblings, but not identical. And that whole Patty Duke thing, total BS. All right. I know you. I know nobody gets that reference, Laura, and I don't care. It's an old reference. I tell the jokes for me. It makes me happy. When class is over, go ahead and YouTube Patty Duke, and then you will laugh hysterically when you see that. But I don't care. All right. It's for me. All right. <laughs> Every year I, I usually joke, get them every year. I, I tell that joke every year. Nobody gets it. And every year I don't care. That one is for me. Patty Duke. Look it up. All right. Excellent. So the point is we have tremendous variation, which is one of our goals to get that uniqueness to these cells. And this is going to help us to do that, how we line that up. So prophase, we formed the tetrads. Metaphase, we uh, moved the tetrads. And so just like in mitosis, anaphase is when we separate things. 
when we separate things, we are going to now separate the tetrads. That is our goal here. That synapsin protein we talked about inactivates. The homologous chromosomes come apart and are pulled to the opposite poles. So this is when we get that distinct V shape that we've seen in the past. So. Too many colors. All right. So we formed our tetrads, we moved our tetrads here, we've separated our tetrads. And then, of course, telophase is then when we reform the nucleus. And also, I guess we should throw a cytokinesis in there, uh, divides the cell. So at the end of this process, oops, no. So one, so two, let's cheat and get rid of that one. Now, again, I'm drawing these as chromosomes still, but you would know that at this point they would loosen up into loose chromatin. So they'd just be a big bowl of spaghetti. But I want to remind us of what we have here. You've never actually seen me in the classroom. I draw this poorly on the board as well. I just have horrible penmanship, so. Uh, it doesn't get any better on the on the on the on the board when I'm doing it by hand. Problem is, I've said before, is I'm left-handed, and all the pens I find are all right-handed pens. I can't find any left-handed pens, so that explains why my handwriting is so poor. At least that's what I explained to my wife. Excellent. So again, normally these would be loose chromatin, but I wanted to emphasize this because notice at the end of this process, we have two cells. And how many chromosomes do each of these cells have? Three. Exactly. So at the end of this process, we have two haploid cells, right? Now our cells have half the number of chromosomes. But what do you notice about the chromosomes? We still have, we do have three chromosomes, but how many copies of the genetic? They're still homologous. Well, they're not homologous, they're still replicated. We still have two copies of the genetic material. So notice if we were going with the nomenclature that we were talking about before, each of these cells would be NR. Because they are haploid cells 
but their DNA is replicated. So we went from a cell that was 2NR to two cells that are NR, haploid, but still replicated. So we've accomplished our first goal. We wanted to make haploid cells, but we only have two of them. And we've also accomplished the goal that they're unique. They're different from each other but we still need to make two more cells. And so to make divide these two cells into four cells, we need a second process. And that second process is going to be meiosis two. Meiosis two, we are now going to separate the chromosomes. in these haploid cells. And if you think about it, separating the chromosomes is basically what we do in mitosis. So essentially, this process is same as mitosis. We are going to have, let's do this, like prophase two. I'll put the names here, in, but I'll move the things as I need them. Metaphase two. Anaphase two. And telophase two. Just like in prophase of mitosis, uh, again, three processes occur in prophase. We break down the nuclear envelope. Uh, we we condense. Let's say fold up uh, the chromatin into chromosomes. And three, we move the centrioles. So again, all of that is the same as we expect. So I'm gonna do it side to side this way just to see if I can get more space in that way. There's my centriole. Nuclear envelope is broken down. And let's see, on the top, I've got dark red. I've got light green. And I have light blue. So that means dark blue. Pink. And dark green. Uh, 
And of course, we can't forget our spindles coming from one side versus the other to connect to these bad boys, to their kineticores. So again, here we form chromosomes. Metaphase two, we move chromosomes. So we line these up on the metaphase plates. Are the little arms reaching from the poles still called mitotic spindle? Is that? Yep, there's still the mitotic spindles. There's still the spindle fibers. Absolutely. So again, just like before, we are going to break down or build up Move it to the metaphase plate so we get that dynamic moving. So we form chromosomes, we moved our chromosomes, now we're going to separate our chromosomes. And so again, this is where we get that distinct V shape. Right, this is when the centromere inactivates. As the centromere inactivates, we are then able to break down these uh, microtubules, these spindle fibers. I don't care about my Adobe cloud. And we get those nice distinct shape V shaped now sister chromosomes or daughter chromosomes, I should say, as the sister chromatids have been pulled apart. V, 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 V. So again, centromeres and activate, and our daughter chromosomes are pulled to opposite poles. Made myself a lot of room for this today. That's all right.
And after telephase, we have our end product. Or unique haploid cells. So again, this includes cytokinesis. So as a result of this, we get The end of this process, our goal was to get four cells, four haploid cells. And that's what we have here. Each one of these cells just has one copy of each of the unique chromosomes. So each individual cell we would indicate as just N. So four haploid cells. As a result of that. All right. Questions on that. I know it's a lot of information. But have we accomplished our original goal? We used two divisions to divide one cell into four cells. Did we do that? Yep. We want haploid cells. Did we do that? Yep. We want cells that are uniquely different from the original. Did we do that? We want four cells that are all uniquely uh, different from each other. Did we do that? So prophase two, each of those cells is an NR, correct? Yes, so we exactly, we're here in prophase, we are starting with cells that are NR. Did the chromatids cross over? Ah, so that's what I, the point I was, the last point I was trying to make. Notice the way we've done this, the top two cells and the bottom two cells are actually identical to each other, aren't they? These two cells are, these two cells are different. Here, let's use that. These two cells are different, but notice these two aren't. These two aren't. So you are correct. We've done most of what we wanted to do, but we don't have four truly unique cells. And that is because, as Daniel pointed out, there is one more process that occurs in this that we haven't mentioned yet. And that one additional process that we haven't mentioned yet that is going to occur is a process that occurs here in prophase called crossover. What happens in crossover is as the tetrads, pardon me, as the tetrads form, what will happen is some of the genetic material changes places.
let's just do one crossover and see what would occur. With this one crossover, what would happen is that a little bit of mom's genetic material would slide over here onto this one, switching places with uh, dads. So there'd be a little bit of dads on this one here. One little piece of genetic information. So again, now this has a little bit of dad on this one. This has a little bit of moms on this one. So when the tetrads form, there's a little bit of mom here. There's a little bit of dad here. So here, dad, here, dad, here, dad, here, dad. So notice down here, this chromosome here has a little bit of mom and a little bit of dads, whereas this one's all moms. These are now unique from each other. And the same thing has happened on the top because there's a little bit of moms up here, a little bit of moms up here, a little bit of moms up here, a little bit of moms up here. So as a result, there's a little bit of mom and a little bit of dad on this one, whereas the other one's all dad. So notice just by having one single crossover, we now truly have unique cells. And when prophase occurs, is there only gonna be one crossover that happens? No, dozens of crossovers can occur randomly across all of the chromosomes. So remember, just by flipping the coins, we had 8 million possibilities of how these could line up. When you start including random crossovers in this event, there is truly an infinite number of combinations of how we can add these things together. So you truly get unique individuals with unique chromosomes. So you have siblings that can vary, and this isn't even a mistake. This is not a mistake. These are not mutations. This is a purposeful process that occurs, a random process that occurs, but it's a way of varying genetic information. That's how you know your kid can have grandma's eyes, but grandpa's ears, right? You can get those combinations of mixing and matching of materials so that it isn't just all moms or all dads on a particular gene you can basically get almost an infinite number of combinations. So just another way of getting some variability in this. And this happens during prophase one of meiosis? During prophase one when they're lining up, absolutely. Again, whether you like it or don't, I've got these drawings here, but your book has some nice pictures that show this stuff as well. So let's look at some of the pictures from your textbook and see if that helps a little bit, right? Here, we see that example of a simplicity of the system that we've just finished talking about. In mitosis, notice like the cell I drew, it has a total of six chromosomes. Chromosomes one, chromosomes two, chromosomes three, and they've color coded it. Uh, dark can be from mom, light can be from dad. We replicate those, we separate the replications. So in mitosis, our goal with one division is two cells identical to each other, identical to the original. For meiosis, we still need to replicate the DNA, but notice during prophase, our homologous chromosomes find each other, match up with each other, and we form the tetrad. So meiosis one is all about dealing with the tetrad. And if we can, whoops, that's way too big. Meiosis one is all about dealing with the tetrad, making the tetrad, lining up the tetrad, dividing the tetrad. And that way, as a result of dealing with the tetrads, we get haploid cells. So notice both of these cells have half the number of chromosomes but the chromosomes are still replicated. So these are still NR. They're still replicated cells. So that allows us to do a second division 
where we can divide those replicated chromosomes, just like over here in mitosis, we divided our replicated chromosomes. That's what's happening here. We divide our replicated chromosomes. That's what meiosis II is about, giving us four unique cells. Now notice here, we have that same problem where two of them are identical to each other. But remember here, we see this nice example how when those tetrads are forming, we get some crossover that occurs. So notice here a little bit of mom's and dad's chromosome change positions. In this one, it happened twice. On this one, it happened twice. So prophase, we form the tetrads. Metaphase, we line up the tetrads. Anaphase, we separate the tetrads. So then in telophase, we have two haploid cells. We then in meiosis two, separate those. And notice here, they've only grabbed one of these to look at, but remember the exact same thing's happening to the other one. And notice because of that crossover, when you separate them, we end up with two unique cells. So that crossover makes sure, A, that all the chromosome, all the gametes that are produced are unique. And like I said, it gives us infinite number of possible genetic combinations. So we have tremendous genetic variability in how we produce offspring. And one last picture. This is the one from your textbook, which I really like because again, it shows a crossover. Notice just one, but with that one crossover, we get our meiosis one, we get our meiosis two. And notice at the end of this process, even with just one crossover, we end up with four unique cells. And that's our goal. These cells are all unique from each other. These cells are all unique from the original. They're haploid and they are unique. So can more crossovers happen during prophase two? No, because if you think about it, during prophase two, there's really nothing to cross over. This, these are the, the homologous sister chromatids. It's really between the homologous chromosomes where that make, takes place. If you think about it, since uh, let's think in simple terms. If you think about it, if even if crossover occurred down here during prophase two, you would basically be switching to identical pieces of information. These are both mom's chromosomes with mom's information. So switching one to the other, they're gonna have the exact same effect. There's no difference. And even if you crossed over a second time here up at the top, the only thing that would be different is where this went. If you move it over to the left, it's gonna to go to the left. If you move it over to the right, it's gonna to go to the right, but it's not gonna change the end results. The only thing that would be different was these two cells would be switched. And does it really matter whether it's on the left or the right? No. It's only in meiosis one, whoops, go back to this one. It's only here in meiosis one where we have the two homologous chromosomes with potentially different information side by side where crossover can make a difference. So it only happens in, and again, I'm showing it emphasizing here, but it only happens here in prophase when those tetrads are forming. This is where that crossover occurs. All right. So questions on this process. This doesn't make sense. It's only going to get worse from here. So if this doesn't make sense, now is the time when you need to say something. Because guess what? This process of mitosis and meiosis, we are talking about the male reproductive process now. Females are going to use these exact same things. This process of mitosis and meiosis occurs in both males and in females. So we're gonna use this twice. So it is important that we understand it now at its base. And then we can see how this process is different in both males and females. But at its core, it's the exact same process. The exact same steps are occurring in both males and females. So, so each I, of the sperm cells has one of these ends in it? Yes, so, it, so absolutely, great question. So you're right. If we are now taking this process and taking it to the males, mitosis gives us two cells, one cell that can stay a stem cell so the process can continue. 
and the other undergoes meiosis. So as an end result of meiosis, we end up with four cell-shaped cells that are haploid with unique genetic information. And so then in males, we need a third step. That third step is going to be to change these cell-shaped cells into sperm-shaped cells. All right. So remember, we talked about this process of making a gamete in males requires three steps. Do females need a third step? Do they need to change the shape of the egg? No, but males do. So basically, once you get to this point in the boys, then we need to convert these cells into sperm-shaped cells. We need a third step. In females, they're pretty much done when they reach this stage. Sort of. Females are complicated. So this all happens in the spermatogonium stem cell? Starts with the spermatogonium, yes. So again, as long as we understand mitosis and meiosis, then we can now go directly to the male and see how these two processes of mitosis and meiosis relate. So are we comfortable with mitosis and meiosis? Any more questions on mitosis and meiosis before we switch gears? Okay, if we understand what's occurring in these stages, then let's go back to here. Let me save this because this is far too much work. I need to print this out and hang it on my wall. All right, uh, save that. Did I save that? I don't know. I'll save it a second time just to make sure. Excellent. Now what we are going to do is we are going to talk specifically about the process of spermatogenesis. Spermatogenesis is the three-stage process for producing sperm shaped cells. Notice I didn't say viable spermatogonia. I said just sperm shaped cells. And those three steps, as we talked about, are first mitosis, two meiosis, and three spermiogenesis. Notice not spermatogenesis, spermiogenesis, different processes. And I think we emphasize this, this all occurs in the seminiferous tumbules. And is regulated by the nurse cells. This starts This starts up here at the base of the seminiferous tubule. So remember up here is that myoid cell. That smooth muscle cell that is gonna to help to contract the seminiferous tubule. And up here at the top, nope, that and that is our stem cell. Is our stem cell, our spermatogonium. So stem cells, as we know, and it's a unipotent stem cell, I guess we can put that here as well. Does what stem cells do, divides mitotically and produces two identical cells. And those two identical cells have fancy names, cell A and cell B.
And of course, these are haploid cells, diploid cells, sorry, diploid cells. And we want the cells to be identical that are produced. Cells may be a little big for what I need. So let's go down a little bit. All right. So there you go. Step one, mitosis. Mission accomplished. Now, of these two cells, these two cells are identical in everything but location. Typically, what happens is one of them, the one that is closest to the basal surface, basically matures into a new spermatogonium. Basically, it replaces the original cell. And this allows the process to continue. Right? If we used up both of these cells to make sperm, then that stem cell would be gone. And eventually, we would run out. If a male is going to produce half a billion of them a day, we have to always be able to replace the stem cell. And if we can replace the stem cell, we can keep this process going forever. All right. However, the second cell further away from the basal surface does something different. It matures into and becomes our primary spermatocyte. And the primary thing that it does during this process is it prepares for meiosis. And of course, part of that preparing for meiosis is synthesis of the DNA getting ready to divide. So what ends up happening is this cell becomes a big, huge, large cell known as that primary spermatocyte. And that primary spermatocyte, by replicating the DNA, is now 2NR. This primary spermatocyte undergoes meiosis one. And what is the end result of meiosis one? How many cells do we have after meiosis one? Two cells. cells. Two cells, excellent. What do we know about these two cells? identical. They are, uh, are they identical? They're not identical. What else do we know about them? And the chromosomes are replicated. The chromosomes are replicated, but what about the number of chromosomes that they have? 26. Exactly. So notice they're haploid and replicated. Absolutely. So after uh, meiosis one, we have two haploid and replicated cells. And we call these secondary spermatocytes. Now, obviously primary spermatocytes are primary because they come first. Secondary spermatocytes are secondary because they come second. But how many primary spermatocytes do we have? Looks like one to me. How many secondary spermatocytes do we have? Two, there you go. So it makes it easy to remember. One primary, two secondary spermatocytes. These two secondary spermatocytes 
undergo meiosis two. And how many cells do we have after meiosis two? Four unique haploid cells. There you go. Four unique haploid cells. And these four unique haploid cells Uh, we call early spermatids. Sorry, give me one second here. Sorry, my daughter's school, and as you know, uh, with her allergy, I always have to check when that's the case, so I do apologize for that. Um, all right, four unique haploid cells called early spermatids because we have now completed meiosis, but we do have a fourth, I mean, a third step in this process, and unfortunately, I've run out of room, so I'll have to cheat and throw my four early spermatids up here. So these are my four unique early spermatids. they then need to undergo spermiogenesis. And when they undergo spermiogenesis, these four cell-shaped cells become four sperm-shaped cells. And these sperm shade cells we call late spermatids. These late spermatids reach the lumen of the seminiferous tubules. And when they reach the lumen of the seminiferous tubules, they are then moved uh, by contractions and fluid forces out of the testis and into the epididymis. There we go. Um, I have a quick question. So yeah. no, um, the pictures, the size, the size not to scale or whatever, but um, if you have like, for example, the primary spermatocyte, is it like larger than the four, um, the, than the early spermatids? Absolutely, that is a great question. In fact, that is how we are going to easily identify it histologically. The spermatogonium is gonna be the one that is always going to be closest to the wall of isomaniferous tubule, but our uh, primary spermatocyte is going to be the largest. Right with a big huge with the most uh, with the most chromosomes in it, it is then going to go into much smaller cells and then even smaller cells from that. So it's also the distance from the wall, but also the relative size. So how far it is from to cl how close it is to the lumen, how far it is from the basal surface, and also the size that we're going to be able to use to identify these things histologically. In fact, let's do that. So again, here we see the walls of our seminiferous tubule. Here is at a very low magnification. But let's go to this picture here. Notice as we go to this picture here, we can see a couple of things. Notice there are these cells 
right next to the basal surface of our seminiferous tubule. And notice because they're mitotic cells rapidly dividing, not surprisingly, we see that loose chromatin has been condensed down into chromosomes into these. Those are stem cells. Those are, yes, indeed. Uh, those are the, uh, the spermatogonium. However, notice by far the largest cells are the primary spermatocytes. So we can see these big, large, obviously big primary spermatocytes that are much, much larger, easy to distinguish from the ones right next to them that are gonna be significantly smaller, which are going to be the secondary spermatocytes. These secondary spermatocytes can then further divide into the smaller. It looks like these are kind of transitional spermatids. Notice these spermatids around here are much more late spermatids, whereas something like these two here are probably much more early spermatids because they're more cell-shaped cells. And then these are kind of somewhere in between. So both their relation from the, oh, and ooh, excellent. Look at that right there, smack dab in the middle. There's that nucleus of that nurse cell, nice elongated nucleus of the nurse cell. But as I was getting ready to say, the two things you're gonna look for is the distance from the wall towards the lumen and the relative size, which is gonna help you to be able to distinguish these histologically. So absolutely positively on an exam, I will show you histology slides of the testis and you should be able to distinguish the different stages of spermatogenesis uh, by their shape, by their size, by their relative location in the lumen. All so right. these little wispy things in the lumen, is that the fully formed late spermat? Is that a late spermatid? Yeah, these things down here are the sperm-shaped cells. These are the late spermatids. Yes, absolutely. You can see the head, you can see the flagellum. And again, we haven't talked about the anatomy of them, but I think most of us have a basic understanding of what a sperm looks like. But we will talk about that in just a minute. All right, let us go back to this now. Now that we've done it on the uh, on uh, the whiteboard, let's go ahead and look at this process on the pretty pictures from the textbook and stuff. So again, we are going to go through these stages stem cell spermatogonium to a primary spermatocyte to a secondary spermatocyte to both early and late spermatids. And then ultimately outside the testis, we will have that mature viable sperm. But let's start here first. Notice here we have uh, that basal cell, that basal surface with that spermatogonium that is going to begin to divide mitotically, producing two identical cells, type A, which stays a stem cell and type B, which becomes the primary spermatocyte. Now, let's answer a couple quick questions. As we know, this doesn't occur throughout the male's life. When does this process begin? Puberty? Yeah, basically puberty. Give me a ballpark of when that is. 12, 12 to 14. 12, 12 to 15, I like that. 12 to 15 is a good range. Excellent, so that's a good, nice range for that. Excellent. And when does the process end? Never. When you die. Yeah, there you go. Probably about 15 minutes after death. All right. Males basically start producing sperm at puberty and do for their entire life. All right, which is why you end up with people like Tony Randall having kids that he's too far too old and frail to be able to even pick up and take care of. All right. Excellent. As we've also talked about, uh, what hormone is responsible for regulating this process? Follicle stimulating hormone. There you go, that follicle stimulating hormone uh, produced and released from the anterior pituitary is the hormone that is involved in that. And again, it stimulates, I wanna emphasize this, this follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the nurse cells and then it is the nurse cells 
that release the chemical signals that um, drive this process. And that process starts with mitosis of our spermatogonia. It divides mitotically into two identical cells. The type A cell stays a spermatogonia, replaces the cell that divides. And that way this process continue for the entire life of the male. And as we mentioned, it is that second one, the type B cell, that is going to mature to become that primary spermatocyte. And notice, as we mentioned, your book just shows it as 2N, but you and I know that it's really 2NR. This cell has replicated DNA and it is ready to undergo meiosis. And that's what happens next. Our primary spermatocyte, uh, I guess I have to erase that and that and that and that and that. But we'll leave that one there. Primary spermatocyte undergoes meiosis one, giving us two haploid cells. But again, you and I know that those haploid cells still have replicated DNA in them. And those two haploid cells with replicated DNA are called the secondary spermatocytes. Our secondary spermatocytes undergo meiosis two, forming four unique haploid cells. And then those four unique haploid cells called early spermatids undergo the process of spermiogenesis to go from cell-shaped cells to sperm-shaped cells. Now, your book actually does a really nice job of describing the process of spermiogenesis. I am not gonna hold you responsible for the seven stage process that involves in all of that. But again, the key take home message about spermiogenesis is as we talked about before, the function of the sperm is basically to be a chromosome missile. All the male uh, provides for the offspring is half the genetic material. Of that fertilized egg, and anybody remember what we call a fertilized egg? Zygo. Zygo, excellent. Everything in that zygote that is going to allow it to divide, allow it to be successful, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria, the Golgi apparatus, the centrosome, all of the organelles of that all come from mom. The only thing dad provides is half the genetic material. And so basically, it needs to shed most of its materials. and basically become specialized for motility, right? The one special thing about the sperm is it is the only human cell uh, that is capable, single cell that is capable of propelling itself through space. And you could argue, well, muscle cell contracts and propels itself through space. No, only if it's attached to a bone. That has to attach to the bone and then it moves the bone through space. This sperm has a very specialized shape to it, uh, which again, gives it its final form. As we said, the nurse cells stimulate this process. They're gonna phagocytose the excess cytoplasm and recycle that so that it can continue onward 
And then the end result of this is that sperm shape. Well, not that part. So actually, that's not actually true. After this process, what we have here is we have four sperm shaped cells. that we call our late spermatids. These cells have the shape of a sperm, right? They are physically mature, but they are not capable of fertilizing an egg yet. They're not functional yet. This process of becoming physically mature, again, from going to stem cell, to a sperm-shaped cell, takes about 70 days. But once it's a sperm-shaped cell, as I mentioned, it has to go to, well, let's do, I'll write this here, and then, well, even though I'm gonna say it again. It then goes to the epididymis, to mature, and that takes an additional 20 days. So from stem cell to viable gamete takes about 90 days, right? You thought the lines at Disneyland were long. Imagine waiting 90 days for a three minute ride, right? Excellent. Now, as we see, I'm sorry. Is that why so many are made because it takes so long? Um, well, again, you say it takes so long, but when we see the female process, how long does it take a female to mature a gamete? 28 ish days. Mm, that's not, that's actually, okay. That is how long it takes to mature it, but to go from stem cell to mature in a female, how long does it take? Any idea? Anybody know when uh, egg formation begins? When the fetus is developing. Yeah, in utero. When you were growing inside of mom's belly, you made all of the eggs you're ever going to have. So if you think about it, if you got pregnant with the very first egg that you released, that would be what, 13 years from stem cell to mature gamete? So yeah, 90 seems like a long time, but not compared to females, but you're right. It is, a, it is a long process. So we do want to have as many available as possible because also in an ovulation, how many eggs does a female release? One. In an ejaculation, how much sperm does a male release? A lot. Millions. Millions, half a billion probably. 500 million or something, somewhere between two and 500 million sperm are released in a single ejaculate. All right. So absolutely. Now let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of our spermatozoon here. It has three distinct regions. It has the head, which is the genetic region, because obviously it contains the nucleus with the chromosomes inside. However, one of the interesting things about it is it has this large hard cap on top of it, known as the acrosomial cap. This cap contains digestive enzymes. One of the things, if you've taken me from 430, but heck, even if you've just had me here for 431, uh, often when we talk about things that have an outer layer, an inner layer, I use the joke that something has a candy coated shell. Well, when we get to that egg, the egg actually has a candy coated shell. The gamete that is released by the female has a very thick glycogen rich outer protective layer. And these digestive enzymes are gonna help the sperm break through that candy coated shell to help it to be able to fertilize the egg. So having this acrosomial cap contains a large number of digestive enzymes to break through that hard candy coated shell. The mid piece, I'm sorry? I said, is there a particular reason for that shell? Protection. From like viral particles? 
sure, probably stuff like that. And and again, it, the other thing about it too is, you know, in the movies and the cartoons, you always see it's the sperm racing to get to the egg, right? And the first one there wins, right? Nothing could be further from the truth. There is truly nothing more American than the fertilization of the egg. Because what happens is the first 200 that get there, get there and beat their heads across that uh, hard glycogen shell, cracking it, breaking it down bit by bit by bit, killing themselves literally in the process of breaking it down. And then it's that lazy 201st one that strolls up an hour later after all the other works that's been done that wiggles its way through the hole that all the other ones made so that it could fertilize the egg. America. Right. So, uh, again, it's it 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 helps to facilitate the process, provide some protection, help to make sure that you have a um, a a sexually uh, physically viable male to be able to do that. You want a healthy male who's producing enough gametes that's healthy enough and viable enough to be able to crack that shell and get inside. So, again, there, there's definitely some benefits and advantages to that. All right, this middle piece is known as the metabolic region because this mid piece, basically all the mitochondria in this region spiral around this motor-like structure. The mid piece basically contains a rotary motor. Uh, I don't have a ruler. I can cheat with a pen. It has a motory, uh, motory a rotary motor in it. And basically what it does is it rotates the tail around. By rotating the tail in this whip-like fashion, it produces that motion that is gonna propel it through space. Well, for that rotary motion, every notch of that motor requires an ATP. So if I'm gonna whip that tail around so I can propel myself with through space, I need a massive amount of ATP to be able to do that. And so that is what this region is. By having all of these mitochondria spiraled around there, we can use the resources that are in the semen to produce a massive amount of ATP to propel this sperm where we need it to go. All right. And lastly, as I mentioned, our locomotor region, our tail region is that flagellum that specialized organelle, that extension of the cell uh, that again, basically is propelled in that whip-like fashion to move the sperm through space. Where does the cell get all of the nutrients to supply that ATP or synthesize that ATP? From the semen. Again, remember this sperm isn't going, remember it's not moving, it's not propelling, it's not rotating its sperm, its tail uh, to move through the ductwork system of the male. It is only upon ejaculation that the uh, fluids produced by those accessory glands turn the swimming motion on and provide the nutrients, the resources, the other materials necessary for, all, for the production of all the ATP needed to get that sperm where it needs to go. Yep, that's the whole point of the semen. It's not just sperm, but there's all sorts of other important chemicals and components uh, in that to provide the resources and to activate that sperm so that it can swim. So there you go. Here's that pretty picture, again, showing that process. Here we have the nurse cells, although notice our nurse cells have these very weird looking nuclei. I don't know why they chose to do that, artistic license, but at least they showed us those tight junctions that are gonna form that blood testis barrier. Our stem cell dividing to two identical cells. One of those identical cells becoming our primary spermatocyte, it dividing into our two secondaries, those dividing into our four early spermatids and our four early spermatids becoming late spermatids. And those finally mature physically, but not mature functioning uh, spermatozoa are now ready to leave the seminiferous tubule out of the testis. All right, questions on that? 
All right, we went a little long on that one, but again, I think all of these things related, so I think it was important to go ahead and do that. But let's go ahead and take our second break now. Uh, again, let's go ahead and take, uh, since I went a little longer and we're doing good on time, I think we can take a little bit of a longer break. So let's go ahead and take a 20 minute break, really give a chance to everybody catch their breath and catch up on everything. So let's uh, restart at uh, 1110. And at 1110, I will start the recording from there. All right, any questions? All righty, I will see you guys in 20 minutes. All righty, let's go ahead and get started. So, questions. We have talked about mitosis, we have talked about meiosis, two important general processes that we need to understand and how they relate to each other. And now we've taken those processes and related them specifically to the process of forming gametes in males, the process known as spermatogenesis, which involves mitosis and then meiosis, and then a third process called spermiogenesis. We talked about how this process takes about 70 days and all occurs in the seminiferous tubule. All right, so any questions on any of that? All right, excellent. Stunned silence means that we understand it, so let's move on. As I mentioned, this is all occurring here inside of our seminiferous tubules, in those individual lobules, in those individual compartments made by the septums of the tunica albigenia. As those occur, they then need to leave the seminiferous tubules into this mesh net-like structure that is known as the retestis. And if you'll notice the way they get there, let me switch colors, is this tiny little singular uh, path, a singular duct that exits the lobule into this mesh-like structure known as the straight tubule. So from the seminiferous tubule, it goes into the straight tubule and into the reet testis. And remember, as we talked about, the cells are not propelling themselves. It is that hydrostatic pressure by the fluid produced by the nurse cells and the contractions of the myoid cells that move the sperm, some of the seminiferous tubule into this mesh-like net-like reet testis. From the reet testis, the sperm is then going to leave the testis. And as it leaves the, te the, te the testis, it goes out these structures known as the efferent ductules. And from the efferent ductules, it goes into the epididymis. And again, while they are physical in shape, those spermatozoa are not viable yet. They're not capable of fertilizing eggs. So even if you plucked one out of the reet testis and dropped it right on an egg, it wouldn't be able to do anything. It needs to mature in this big comma-like structure, this big, large tubular structure known as the epididymis. And it gets there via the efferent ductules. So again, if we're uh, following the pathway of the, and actually let's do that. As we mentioned, we have a closed duct system. In males. So it starts in the seminiferous tubules. From there, the sperm have no choice but go into the straight tubules. From the straight tubules, it goes into the reet testis. 
from there it goes into the efferent ductule. And from there it goes into the epididymis. Right. We're not done, we're not out yet, but that is where we are at so far. All right, questions on that? All right, so let's talk more about these uh, epididymis. The epididymis indeed, as I mentioned, is outside of the testis. It is associated to the, te te the testis, as you can see here. Uh, it is basically a large comma-shaped structure with a huge tightly coiled tubular in it that is almost 30 feet long. It is associated with the, te the testis, but not on it. I don't know why I keep trying to say tetanus. I'm not even in the muscular system anymore in uh, 430, so I don't know why I have that on the brain. Um, but it is uh, superior, a lateral, and posterior. So while you are observing the raffi of your male while he is demonstrating the action of the cremaster muscle, feel free to gently palpate his testes. And as you gently palpate the testes, what you will see is there is this large comma-shaped structure that starts superiorly and moves laterally and posteriorly along the line of the testis, and that is the epididymis. So superior, posterior, and lateral on the surface of the testis. Now, the epididymis itself is decided, divided into three distinct regions. We have a, a head, we have a body, and we have a tail. There are slight differences in the convolution of these, slight differences in the function of these, uh, but we're not gonna worry too much about distinguishing the function of the different regions. Instead, let's talk about what happens in the epididymis as a whole. As a whole, there are three major functions of the epididymis. So let's talk about those. And these occur throughout the entire epididymis. The first is to maintain these uh, sperm. The sperm, despite what your male may tell you, can uh, live comfortably inside the ductules of the male reproductive tract for months without expulsion and dying. So they're not gonna become poisonous and kill him if he doesn't expulse them from his body. Uh, but they do need to be maintained. So monitoring and adjusting the composition of the fluid is definitely important. One of the things that is very interesting about the epididymis is here in the males, we find a tissue that we have not seen before in this class. I will give you a hint. We're gonna run into something similar in the female reproductive tract as well. But here we have a ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue, that's not new. But what is new about these is that actually here in the epididymis, those cilia are non-motile they don't actually move in a wave-like motion. Now, the question then of course becomes why? Because it would, since we don't want these to propel themselves, having cilia to move them would seem to make a lot of sense. Of course, why is always one of those questions that's somewhat hard for us to answer. My guess is the reason is that they would move them too quickly. Remember, we need the sperm to stay here in the epididymis for about 20 days so that they can fully mature. Those cilia probably would move too quickly and as a result would move it through that tract much faster than 20 days and so they probably wouldn't be fully mature by the time they leave. Again, I'm guessing because again, the uh, engineer who designed all this didn't leave us her footnotes, but it seems like a reasonable why as to why that would be the case. So very distinct, unique tissue here, easy to identify because it is a ciliated sort of stratified columnar tissue, but those cilia don't move. So very, very interesting, uh, very uh, unique and distinct tissue, easy to identify. And of course, those cilia, since they don't move, are going to give us an increased surface area for the absorption and release of materials and substances into the fluid. Again, it is gonna store the sperm and allow them to mature. And remember this maturation process requires those androgens, 
which remember were brought by the antigen binding proteins that were formed by the nurse cells. So those antigen binding uh, proteins brought by the nurse cells are here in the fluid, brought here and provide for the maturation of the sperm, which as we said, takes about 20 days. But this is also where we do our quality control. Anytime you're making a half a billion of something a day, there's gonna be an occasional error. And so this is an opportunity to assess the sperm and be able to uh, check the sperm to try to remove any that are non-functional, any that have a tail that's too short or two heads with one tail or some other type of abnormality to them. Those can be detected and removed here. And again, you may not have thought of it in these terms, but maybe you or someone you know has tried to get pregnant before. And when you're trying to get pregnant, do they encourage you to have sex 14 times a day, uh, every day for the whole month to just try to just throw as much semen as possible at the problem and see if you can solve it that way? No, typically they encourage you to focus around the time of ovulation. And even then you're not supposed to have sex you know, every day or three times a day. It's like every other day or every three days, one or two times uh, so that you have time to mature and uh, have healthy, viable sperm. It increases the likely. The longer the sperm are in the epididymis, the higher the percentage uh, that you will have of viable sperm. By the time they finally mature and complete through this process, they then exit the epididymis into the ductus deferens, or what is also known as the vas deferens. Both of those terms are acceptable terms for that structure whose job it is to then carry it back into the abdominal pelvic cavity. And at this point, as it leaves the epididymis into the ductus deferens, they are mature viable sperm. So we cheat and go back to our list. Brown what happens to the sperm when that's cut? Why would you cut that? Or a vasectomy. There you go, exactly. It's the male form of birth control, absolutely. Yep, we'll talk about that in just a minute, but absolutely you have the right idea. So let's go ahead and answer the question now. Here we see this great illustration of this from the sagittal view. And notice from the sagittal view, we see the testis, uh, we see that comma-shaped epididymis, and then we see the ductus or vas deferens, which is why it's called a vasectomy. And that uh, vast, that vast, uh, that vast deference or the ductus deference, as you can see, uh, travels out of the scrotal sac through the spermatocord, and it actually goes over the pubic symphysis. So if you find, again, while you're palpating the testis of your male, feel free to gently palpate his pubic symphysis. And when you palpate his pubic symphysis a little bit lateral to the midline, you can actually feel, feel the spermatic cord that has that ductus deferens that travels up over the pubic bone into that inguinal canal. So you are absolutely correct. In the process of a vasectomy, the goal is to come in here and to basically make an incision in that ductus deferens to stop the sperm from getting into the body and becoming part of the ejaculate. Now, when they first started performing this, uh, again, the advantage of this is basically it's an outpatient surgery that can be done typically with a local anesthetic. Uh, it, it's one of those things that can be a Friday surgery and you can be back at work on Monday. Does anybody know when the most vasectomies, the highest number of vasectomies are, are um, performed in the United States? Typically the first or second week of March. Why? They got their significant other pregnant over the winter? <laughs> Not a bad guess. No, something even more superficial than that. March madness, right? Uh, March madness, think about it. Uh, here it is Wednesday. You have to have a surgery where you then have to basically sit in a chair with a you know bag of frozen peas 
on your uh, testicles for three days while you can uh, watch basketball all day long for three or four straight days. In fact, there was a, uh, a urologist in Minnesota several years ago, and I think he still does it, who did a March Madness special. He gave you a discount on the, uh, on, he gave a discount on the vasectomy and threw in a free pizza so that you could basically just sit on the couch and watch basketball while you recovered from your vasectomy. Absolutely. Now, when they first started producing, uh, started doing vasectomies, basically what they would do is they would take a clip and put a clip over the ductus deferens, squeezing it shut. Why would they want to do something like that? So it could be reversed? It could be reversed, right? Something really, yes, you didn't want to have any more kids right now, but something really, really horrible could have happened, right? One of your kids could have died, your wife could have come unattractive, right? Something could have happened where you need to be able to have other children, and so they wanted to be able to remove it. The problem that they found is that those clips weren't very viable. Uh, they fell off a lot. They didn't do as good a job of sealing it. So what they started to do then instead is they would just simply make an incision, cutting it. Uh, typically, what would happen is you would make an incision through the scrotal sac, typically two, one on each side so that you could get to the, because again, this is a paired structure. However, now many of the urologists make actually just a single incision down the center and then with a little hook, we'll go in and draw out the tube, make the incision and then um, put it back in. However, even just cutting it became an issue because sometimes it could grow back together. So now what they do is, like I said, they will draw the tube out. Basically, they will cut out a portion. Uh, so they will cut out a chunk of the tube and then they will cauterize the two ends to basically make this as permanent of a process as they possibly can. In fact, since most of these are done through HMOs, uh, you are actually required to actually take a class where you go to, and they talk to you about all those horrible things, like what happens if your kid dies, what happens if you have a child with an autoimmune disorder, and another kid would be able to be able to provide, a second kid could be used to provide a transplant for them, or your wife dies in a horrible accident, or all these types of horrible things that occur, essentially it is non-reversible. Now, technically it can go in and be reversed in some instances, especially if it occurs within the first year or so, uh, but uh, insurance won't cover it for one. Uh, so that's always an issue for things as well. Uh, but here's the other thing, and this gets back to Laura's question. When that incision first occurs, the testis does continue to produce sperm. Those sperm fill the epididymis, fill the small part of the ductus deferens, and then stop and they sit there for a while and they age and they get old and they eventually get uh, broken down and degenerate and reabsorbed by the tissues and the process continues. But what they found is after a couple of years, sperm production goes down dramatically in the testis and can actually stop completely. So four or five years later, you decide to reconnect the tubing at that point, it may be too late. Your testes may not be capable of producing enough sperm at that point to be able to make you sexually viable. So essentially a vasectomy is a one-way trip, right? But like I said, it is an incredibly non-invasive, very uh, safe surgery, especially compared to the surgical uh, birth control for females, which is in, takes place inside the body, is a much more severe uh, uh, surgery that requires much more recovery from it. So it is a relatively low risk uh, and uh, and uh, high success rate type of surgery that takes place. Absolutely. All right. Excellent. So. Again, sperm's carried through the inguinal canal into the pelvic cavity, over the pubic bone, and like I said, can be stored for months until it is finally released uh, from the uh, male reproductive tract. Again, this is primarily gonna be moved in the ductus deferens via peristalsis. Oops. 
the peristalsis uh, is how it's going to move. Again, they're not swimming on their own. That would be a waste of time. And as we talked about, that male birth control, that vasectomy is the cutting of that ductus deferens. And we talked about that. Excellent. Let's finish the rest of the path. Notice this is a posterior view we were looking at. We can tell this is a posterior view because we see the ureters coming down as, and as we know, the ureters feed into the posterior inferior side of the bladder. And notice that our ductus deferens actually comes up and over the bladder to the back. If we actually go back to that previous picture, this one, here we go, perfect. Notice we can see that that ductus deferens over the pubic symphysis, then over the bladder and actually hooks around the ureter to go to the posterior side. So it hooks over the ureter, comes to the posterior side, at which point there becomes a big enlargement of the ductus deferens, where we store millions and millions of sperm in anticipation of ejaculation, known as the ampulla of the ductus deferens. The other thing we see nicely on this illustration are the three glands that we will talk about as well, the accessory glands. Here we see the two paired seminal vesicles. Here we see uh, the singular prostate. And here we see uh, the two paired bulbourethral glands. We'll talk about the glands in a minute, but the reason I mention it now is that notice the duct of the seminiferous, uh, pardon me, the seminal gland, and the duct of the ampulla of the ductus deferens come together into a singular tubular structure known as the ejaculatory duct. And it is the two ejaculatory ducts that feed into the urethra. So if we wanted to finish our pathway from the ductus deferens, we go into the ampulla of the ductus deferens, which really isn't a separate structure. So I'll just uh, setting it offset here. Uh, but from there, it goes into the ejaculatory duct. And lucky for us, we have learned the three regions of the urethra. So that ejaculatory duct feeds into the portion of the urethra that is surrounded by the prostate. So what was that? Prostatic urethra. There you go. Prostatic urethra. And again, one urethra, one E, unlike those ureters, two E's in ureter. Prosthetic urethra feeds into what portion of the urethra? The part that goes membranous. through your genital diaphragm, membranous. Which feeds into the part that goes through the penis, which is the penile or spongy. urethra, and from there, out of the body. And into the sock. All right, questions on that? Excellent. So again, notice from the point where it is made, and again, let's talk numbers as well. As we know, there are one to four times three. So let's say somewhere around a thousand seminiferous tubules that feed into the many straight tubules. Again, there's gonna be at least one straight tubule per lobule. So that's gonna be somewhere around, I don't know, 500 uh, for the side. Each one then has a reet testis. So there's two reet testises, which feed into, I don't know, some efferent uh, ductules, but we have two epididymises, epididymi, 
epididymi. I like epididymi. Bucket of epididymi. I like that. That works. Epididymi. Two, ductus deferens, feeding into two ejaculatory ducts, and feeding into the one urethra. So again, most of these structures are paired because after all, we have two testes. Uh, and then, uh, but in the urethra, they come together into a singular structure. There you go. And we already talked about the anatomy of the urethra. Is Can one testy sufficient for, um, you know, for being able for, you know, impreg impregnation, fertilization of the egg? Does it produce enough sperm um, to be yeah. functional? Great question. Yes, typically it is. So for, for most individuals, if they were to lose a testis, the remaining testis should be sufficient. However, again, it, I have to say most because are there individuals who have two testes who have a low sperm count and are not capable of producing enough sperm to fertilize a female? Yeah, absolutely. So there could be some people who might be borderline with two and if they lost one, it might drop down below a level where it would be a viable number. So, but for most individuals, yes, one testis is typically sufficient to produce enough sperm. All right, excellent. That is our sperm formation and our, um, are we on time? We're good. Uh, our, uh, our sperm formation, the testis, and all of the ducts. So let's talk about those accessory organs. And again, primarily I'm talking about the three types of glands. The sperm that are produced by the seminiferous tubule and the fluids that are made and modified by the nurse cells and the epididymis only make up about 5% of the volume of our semen. So when you have that ejaculate, the vast majority of that ejaculate is produced by these accessory glands. We talked about the function of this, but it's important to mention it again. One is, of course, to turn the switch on those spermatozoa so that they will start their swimming motion so that they can get where they need to go. That swimming motion needs, requires a massive amount of resources. So we're gonna need the nutrients necessary to produce the ATP so that that motility can be produced. Some of those fluids are also going to help to produce peristaltic contractions within the female's reproductive tract. Uh, this can help to encourage the movement of the sperm towards that egg for fertilization. And lastly, to protect the sperm and to neutralize the acidity, both of the urethra, because remember in the male, the urethra is also a passageway for urine, which as we talked about is typically acidic. And one of my all time favorite things to say in the whole wide world in this class is that the vagina is an incredibly hostile environment, right? And as fun as it is to say, it is also vitally important. One of the things that I have strongly pointed out and hinted at is the reason we talk about the male reproductive system as a closed system is because the female's is not. The female's reproductive tract is open to her abdominal pelvic cavity. So things like sexually transmitted diseases in males stay within the reproductive system. Whereas sexually reproductive, uh, sex, sexual, uh, sorry. Um, so sexually transmitted diseases, as well as other pathogens and other harmful things uh, that get into the female reproductive tract can actually get into the abdominal pelvic cavity and affect other organs. It is an opening to the inside of her body from the outside world. And as such requires tremendous amount of protections. And one of that protections is a huge acidic mantle. 
the vaginal canal is very acidic. That is like we talked about the stomach being acidic. That helps to neutralize any types of pathogens that might try to come in there, which is great and important and necessary and vital for the survival of that female. But here's the problem. Spermatozoa don't swim well in an aesthetic environment. That swimming motion is slowed by acidity. So to get sufficient number of sperms to the egg for fertilization, because as we've learned, it's not just gonna take one, it's gonna take hundreds. If we can neutralize some of that acidity, we can help to facilitate the movement of those sperm, get more to the egg and accomplish our goal of fertilization. So all of those fluids produced by these accessory glands are vitally important for all of these types of functions. Let's briefly talk about each of these. Starting first with the seminal vesicles or what are also known as the seminal glands. Both of those are acceptable terms. Again, as we mentioned, they are paired. Uh, they are also located along the posterior wall, the base of the bladder. And remember their duct meets with the duct of the ductus deferens to form the ejaculatory duct that passes through the prostate. The seminal vesicles produce about 70% of the fluid found in our semen. It is typically more of a thick yellowish alkaline secretion. Of course, the alkalinity is important for neutralizing acidity as we've talked about. And it contains tremendous number. We could spend an hour listing all the stuff that are in these glands, but let's talk about some of the important ones. Uh, there is fructose found in this seminal fluid. Why is that so important? Sperm cells need a source from which to make all that ATP. Yeah, absolutely. We need those sugars to be able to produce ATP. So that is going to help to uh, uh, provide the energy necessary for uh, the sperm to be able to propel themselves. Ascorbic acid, that sounds familiar. What is ascorbic acid? What do we, what is ascorbic Vitamin acid? Vitamin C. Vitamin C, absolutely, right? That's of course, so that the sperm don't catch a cold. There's nothing worse than a sneezing sperm, right? Exactly. No, obviously in this case, as it turns out, ascorbic acid is very important for the activation of the sperm, getting that swimming motion started. So vitamin C plays an important role in our activation of the sperm, getting it going. Uh, something that is also found in our seminal fluid is a coagulating enzyme. Why is it important to have a coagulating enzyme? So that uh, the fluid bunches up and stays. Yeah. Again, remember the goal here is copulation for fertilization, right? So when the ejaculate is released into the vaginal canal, you want the ejaculate to stay there, right? You want, to stay, you want it to stay where it put, you put, you want it to stay where you put it so that the sperm that are in it are capable of getting to their destination, right? If it just poured out, then obviously you would lose a tremendous amount of sperm and the numbers would go down dramatically. So the, it's important for it to stay where it is put to help to facilitate getting enough sperm in there to facilitate fertilization. Prostaglandins are a fun one. These are hormones and hormone-like proteins. They're a class of hormones and hormone-like proteins. Uh, that play an important role in uh, both uh, the uh, capacitation of the cell, of the sperm. Capacitation is the uh, making it capable of fertilizing an egg. But the other thing that these prostaglandins are important of is they are important for facilitating the reverse peristalsis of the female reproductive tract, primarily the uterus 
and the vaginal canal. This reverse peristalsis, normally, if you think about the normal, and again, we haven't talked about the female process, but I think most people in this class are aware uh, that females undergo menses, the shedding of their uterine wall, right? Also, as we just finished talking about, this is an opening to the outside world. Uh, so any type of material that is captured by the mucus, any dust debris pathogens need to be expelled. So there are these minor peristaltic waves basically pushing things out of the female reproductive tract. Well, these prostaglandins actually produce a reverse peristalsis, helping to draw the sperm up uh, and towards the egg for fertilization to take place. You may not have thought of it in these terms, but one of the things that you may have been told if you are pregnant is especially in late stage pregnancy, you have to be very careful about having sex. Right, the last month or two of pregnancy, you have to be very careful about having sex uh, because one of two things can happen. Either the female can be brought to orgasm or if the male ejaculates inside of them and releases those prostaglandins, that can cause contractions of the uterus. And one contraction of the uterus could push the baby a little bit harder against the cervix, leading to a stretch of that cervix, sending a bigger signal to the brain, causing the brain to release oxytocin. There you go, and it can induce labor. It is a bad thing if you are early, you don't wanna induce labor early, but Allison, as you point out, there is an old wives tale if you are late and haven't had the baby yet, that old wives tale is what got you into the mess can get you out of the mess, right? And so you're right, it can actually induce labor. So because it can induce labor, you have to be careful near the end, but if you're past your due date, if it's already fully baked, then uh, have at. All right, excellent. So all of these and more are found in here. And again, the goal is primarily threefold here. We want to provide energy for the sperm. We want to activate the sperm and we want to facilitate that capacitation. Capacitation is basically when it becomes ready to fertilize the um, egg. And that process is capacitation. Skipolini pizza? I don't get that reference. Is there a pizza yeah. place? There's a pizza place called Skipolini's and they have a pizza that is the wives tale is that it induces labor. Is it have a lot of, is it a spicy one? Is it have a lot of capsaicin? It's very spicy. I can attest to this. I used to work there and saw somebody's labor or water break and, go, and they went into labor. <laughs> yeah, I could see where capsaicin could, uh, could cause an irritation to the mucous membrane, which could cause that kind of stuff. So I could buy that. I buy that. That's funny. Excellent. Oh, that baby's going to come out screaming. <laughs> it may be. All right. Excellent. Let's talk about our second important gland, the prostate gland. It is a singular gland. Oops. Singular gland. Uh, notice uh, it completely surrounds the urethra, right? So it is at the base of the bladder and surrounds the urethra. This is one of the reasons why these days uh, you can't watch uh, any kind of sporting event without hearing a commercial about enlarged prostate syndrome, right? Whereas we know that enlargement of the prostate could squeeze the prosthetic urethra, irritating it, which we know that irritation gives us that sensation that we need to void. So the male rushes to the bathroom thinking he needs to void, but not only is his bladder not full, but the constriction also narrows the urethra, making voiding more difficult, right? So again, as, as males age, the prostate tends to enlarge. That's true for most males. Uh, uh, and so it is something that can be an issue that, that can be a concern. Uh, produces about 30% of the uh, ejaculate, the fluid for the ejaculate. And it is much more of a milky, uh, uh, opaque type of secretion that is produced. And again, there are dozens of materials that are found in it, but primarily uh, it is involved in, again, activating the sperm, starting that swimming motion, uh, so and providing protection for that sperm as well. 
One of the interesting things about the prostate, and our illustration does a nice job of showing it, is it actually has a very striped appearance to it. The reason it has this striped appearance is because it doesn't just have one duct. There are massive numbers of ducts, massive numbers of secretary structures that all line up in a row. And so we have these massive numbers of tiny little ducts all pointing and releasing into their urethra upon orgasm uh, and to filling that space. So it has many, many small ducts. And so when you look at it, it has a very striped shape. Now, I think I've got one more picture here I want to show you. Here we go, excellent. Here again, we see uh, that seminal vesicle. We see the prostate here. As I mentioned, prostate enlargement is a fairly common occurrence that occurs in males. And again, we can see how that would be a problem. As you see here, the prosthetic urethra goes right through the stop of it, so the, the center of it. So as it enlarges, it could squeeze that, but while enlargement is something that is common, another concern can be prosthetic cancer. Prosthetic cancer can be a very deadly cancer. Uh, however, it tends to be relatively slow in its progression. So if caught early, it can be resolved relatively easily uh, without having massive concerns against the males. Now, again, as males continue to live longer and longer, the longer a male lives, the more and more likely he is going to uh, end up with prostate cancer. So starting usually around what, 45, 50 years of age, somewhere around that range, a male then starts to need to be examined for that. And of course, how do they do that? With x-ray glasses. <laughs> X-ray glasses would be convenient and nice, but that ain't how they do it. Turn your head and cough. Not quite turn your head and cough. Although the prostate exam. There you go. That's the one I was looking for. A prostate exam. And how do you do a prostate exam? Bend over and spread them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Exactly. The doctor, doctor, puts, doctor puts on a glove. You are correct. There are blood tests that can be done. At rectal tests that can be do it. Uh, absolutely, those can be uh, things. Although those are more for colon cancer. Uh, as opposed to prostate cancer. The primary way that they do it is the doctor inserts a finger into uh, through the anus into the rectum where they can actually palpate the surface of the prostate. Feel the prostate both for its size but also for irregularities because if there's tumors, there can be irregularities on the surface. Uh, so that is uh, a, you know, a digital manipulation of that, uh, that again can test it and is a pretty strong indicator. And if caught early enough, like I said, can be resolved uh, with minimal risks. It is a, it, a, a cancer that is very, if caught early can very successfully be resolved. Uh, but while it's slow growing, if you don't catch it early, it does have the ability to metastasize and affect other areas and can be much more serious. So it is something that is checked more regularly. Now, I don't think that there's too many males in this class old enough to have had this occur to them as a medical test. Why might somebody else pipe, pal palpate their uh, prostate? We're still talking about for science, right? Not necessarily. Is there a reason you would want to do it instead of for science? I don't like where this I is played, I played the fifth. <laughs> yes, there are. Yes, there okay. There are significant reasons for why you would want to do it <laughs> but, without science. There you go. So uh, for some males, not any males, there you go. Allison's got it. Uh, uh, conveniently off camera, I see now. Uh, you are absolutely correct. For some, that for some males, I'll say some because I don't think it's something necessarily many. But for some males, there is a fair amount of sensory receptors associated with the prostate, 
And so the palpation of the prostate can be an incredibly pleasurable sensation that can occur. So that manual manipulation of the prostate is something that can cause some sexual pleasure in some males, absolutely. I make a point of mentioning this, of course, because it's for science, because we're talking about the reproductive system. But remember, we're also talking about male and female, and we're gonna talk about homologous structures. Females have a homologous structure similar to the prostate that also um, that, that have a homologous structure that also for some women have a high number of sensory structures. And so palpating it can cause intense pleasurable sensations for them as well. So I make a point of mentioning it here because we'll talk about it in females as well. So here in the female in males, we talk about the prostate and how that palpation of the prostate can be intensely pleasurable uh, for some individuals. Excellent. That brings us to our third type of gland, the bulbourethral gland, also known as the Cowper gland, because I'm sure Bob Cowper was the first one who described it. These are paired glands. They are the smallest of our glands. And if you notice, this isn't the best illustration to show it, although it kind of is pretty good because um, it's a little bit small, but you can still see it. Notice the glands themselves are actually located in the urogenital diaphragm. So the actual glandular structure is in the urogenital diaphragm. But if you notice, the duct for that gland actually uh, projects forward and actually releases into the penile urethra, not into the membranous urethra. Which if you think about it, makes sense. This we know is where that internal urethral sphincter is a valve that could close. And we wouldn't necessarily want that valve to restrict the movement of this fluid. So this bulbal urethral glands project actually forward into the uh, penile urethra uh, so that they can produce and release their substance. So even though the gland itself is located in the urogenital diaphragm, it does not release into the membranous urethra. It releases into the penile urethra. Now, if my math is correct, we said about 70% of the semen was from the seminal vesicles, about 30% from the prostate. That doesn't leave very many percents left, especially when we think that 5% is sperm and fluid from the epididymis and the uh, nurse cells. So what's going on here? Well, what's going on here is typically these bulbourethral cells produce a very thick, a very viscous, a very alkaline mucousy secretion, and they produce this prior to ejaculation. This is a pre-ejaculate that is produced upon arousal. Why? Kind of clear the way since it's so acidic. Absolutely, so absolutely that is one of it. Absolutely, as we mentioned, the urethra has been lined with urine. We need to cleanse that urine both because of the toxins that are in the urine, the waste materials that are in the urine, and also the acidity. Remember we talked about that acidity can be bad uh, for the swimming motion of the sperm. And as Allison also pointed out, it acts as a lubricant, right, to help to facilitate copulation. Right? We need to get the copulatory organs, the penis and the vagina to come together and lubrication uh, helps to facilitate that process. So this pre-ejaculate that is produced helps to uh, clear the path. Now, we do have one major issue with this, and I guess we'll talk about it in a second. I don't know if we're gonna talk about it here or we'll talk about it later. Uh, but upon arousal, these glands become active, but also, because I wanna do this here because the picture is here. Upon arousal, we start to produce peristaltic contractions. including in the ampullas of our ductus deferens. 
So when this pre-ejaculate is being produced, our uh, ampullas can be contracting peristolically and actually putting sperm into this pre-ejaculate. Why is that important to know? Because you can get someone pregnant even if you don't ejaculate. Exactly, right? Withdrawal is not a viable form of uh, birth control. In fact, because the volume of the pre-ejaculate is so small compared to the regular ejaculate of the semen, it actually can have a higher percentage of sperm in it than the ejaculate itself. Meaning potentially it could be even more fertile than the ejaculate itself. So yes, absolutely. Uh, withdrawal is not a viable method. The pre-ejaculate can in some cases be sufficient to fertilize a female. All right, so make sure all of your teenagers know that. All right, excellent. We mix all of this up into our big soup, our sperm and all our accessory glands together and we get semen. A fairly alkaline pH of about 7.3 to 7.7, .7, uh, opaque milky appearing substance. The typical size of an ejaculate is somewhere between two and five milliliters of semen. Again, remember about 5% of that is sperm. But while percentage wise, that is a relatively small amount, it can contain anywhere from 20 to 150 million per milliliter. Multiply that times five. And as I mentioned, you can have somewhere between you know, 100 and 500 million sperm per ejaculate, which seems crazily excessive. However, it's not, right? Uh, if someone has a, a, a sperm count of 25 million sperm per milliliter, that is actually considered low. And if you are below 20, you are considered to be infertile, All right? So you could have 18 million sperm per milliliter of ejaculate, and you are still considered uh, to, be, um, to be infertile, incapable of fertilizing a female. Now, remember, we are processing those sperm in the epididymis. So at least 60% of the sperm are gonna be fully viable and fully functional. If it has been a while since ejaculation takes place, that number can be higher. Remember, as we talked about, you don't wanna ejaculate every day if you're trying to get pregnant every other day. That can get as high as 70, maybe even 75%. But if a male is continuously ejaculating, uh, that number can drop below 50%. So not only would the number of sperm in their ejaculate be lower, but the percentage of them that would be viable would be lower as well. So it does not make it a, a reasonable uh, uh, method for fertilization to take place. All right, questions on that? How are we on time? We're doing good, excellent. All right, so the last thing that I want to talk about for today, that's everything I wanted to cover for lecture. The last thing I wanted to cover before we finish Yeah, we can do that and that. We had our, I wanna do a little bit more histology just because we had talked about this and it's fresh in our mind. We had talked about our seminiferous tubules and the cells and recognizing the cells by obviously the shape of the nuclei, their location, their relative size and all of those things. So we talked about all of that, some more great nurse cells. And again, great examples of these. However, what I find that some people have a challenge with, and ignore the arrows, this is just somebody else's slide that I stole from the interwebs. 
uh, people sometimes have a difficulty distinguishing the seminiferous tubules from the epididymis. On the surface, they can seem similar, but the key to that is only on the surface. Notice as you look at this, it looks like there's a whole bunch of flagella that are coming out of these. So that must be those late spermatids that are coming out. Are these indeed flagella that are extending out here? Non-motile microvilli. Those are the non-motile microvilli, absolutely. So that can be really, really confusing. But there's a couple key factors you can use to tell the difference between our seminiferous tubules and our epididymis. Notice in our seminiferous tubules, we have all these nuclei of all the cells going all the way from the basal surface all the way to the lumen. We see nuclei throughout, clearly multiple layers of cells. The epididymis is a ciliated pseudostratified, so it looks like we have multiple layers of nuclei. But do the nuclei go all the way to the lumen? Not really. You know, there may be one or two that we see here, but for the most part, they're just more basal. Said this image is the what again? This is the epididymis. The other big way besides the tissue itself that you're gonna be able to distinguish what this is, is by looking at the spermatozoa. Remember, in the epididymis, we are producing these late spermatids and they are literally coming out of the wall. However, the epididymis isn't making them. It is collecting them, storing them, and storing them in fluid. So when we freeze this tissue and slice this tissue and process this tissue with stain, it dehydrates that fluid. And notice when it dehydrates the fluid, all of the sperm clump together in the center of the lumen. So the characteristics of the wall and this clumping of the sperm in the center are gonna be how you're gonna distinguish the epididymis from the seminiferous tubules. What's this one? This epididymis or is this seminiferous tubules? Epididymis. This is the epididymis, there you go. Notice we've got plenty of nuclei but none really near the edge. Yes, there's an occasional one here and there, but in the seminiferous tubule, are you gonna see four nuclei near the lumen of that? No, the number of nuclei get bigger. There are more nuclei as you get towards the lumen, not less. And this huge clumping together of the sperm. So if you focus on those two key characteristics, you should be able to easily tell the difference between the epididymis and the seminiferous tubule. All right. I think that is all I wanted to cover for that right now. Oh, nope, I lied, one more. It's that. What am I looking at here? Flagellum. Well, sperm is what we're looking at here, absolutely. We are looking at spermatozoa, right? As we look at the spermatozoa, we can see uh, the head, right? Or the genetic region. And notice also kind of shaded up here on the top, it's slightly lighter in color. This one has the slightly lighter color as well. Those are things that are the acrosomial caps that are on the top of that. We have the thickened motor region where we are going to have those mitochondria wrapped around 
uh, to propel that propulsion. And then absolutely, we have those locomotive region, the flagella that are going to propel it to its destination. Oh, there's a really good acrosomial cap we can see here very distinctly on that one there, very distinctly on that one there, very distinctly on that one there. So some of these, we can see these really nicely. I think I have one more picture too. There you go. So you notice this one with the color, again, we can very easily see that light colored tip, which is where that acrosomial cap is. So again, with this stain, we can see that light colored tip, which is where that acrosomial cap is on that head of it. I think that's only really, the only really tricky thing to the anatomy of this is being able to see that acrosomial cap on the head. All right. And there you go. That's the histology uh, covering what we've talked about so far. All right. Any questions on that? All right. Excellent. Then uh, we finished a little bit early today, which is definitely a good thing. We are done with that. That is all the material I wanted to cover for today. On Monday, uh, who knows what might happen at the beginning of class, but after that, uh, we uh, will finish off the rest of the uh, male uh, reproductive system, and then we will move on to the female and do the female for the rest of it. And then at the end, we'll have some little fun with genetics if we have time at the end. But I also know you're doing the Mendel Labster, so that will help you to understand that genetic stuff we have as well. So uh, you have a busy weekend. You are running out of weekends to study. This is definitely one of them. Even though we've just started the material, take advantage of this time to study this material. Make sure the mitosis and the meiosis make sense. Uh, spermatogenesis makes sense. Those are all things that I guarantee are possible essay questions. Uh, so make sure you understand all of those things. And then if you wanna start looking ahead at the female process, oogenesis, notice we have two very related processes, spermatogenesis and oogenesis. So how many possible essay questions can we have for that? Three, there you go. Describe process one, describe process two, compare the two processes. And that's exactly what we're gonna do on Monday. So not a horrible idea to get a head start thinking about that as well. All right, any other questions? Yeah, so um, uh, kind of preparing to study for just the final slowly, uh, is it gonna be cumulative in the sense that it's just this, it's just 431, right? Not cumulative in 430 and 431? So you have the right idea. It is gonna focus on the material that we have covered here in 430, however, have we rehashed information from 430 here? Yeah. Talking about tissues, we've talked about bones and bone features, right? Anything from 430 that we've used would be. But am I going to ask you the four mm. actions of the sartorius muscle on this final exam? No, absolutely not. That was uh, that was so stuff that was specifically 430 is specifically 430, right? The two are related. So obviously things like tissues, things like bones, there are some things we've used again, uh, but uh, but but no, it's going to focus on 431. Yeah, you're done with origins and insertions. But we did talk about muscles involved in respiration, right? So while you don't necessarily know, need to know origins and insertions, do you need to know those respiratory muscles and what their actions were? Yeah, so I think that's actually a great example. You don't need to know the origins and insertions of those, but those respiratory muscles are things we talked about, and those are definitely things that could be on the exam. All right, excellent. All righty, then you guys have a good weekend, and I will see you on Monday.